Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome you on the second day of the World Fintech Festival here in Budapest. I'm Peter Linker, and once again, I'm honored to be your host on this, the second day of this unique event. Yesterday, we were fortunate to attain a deeper understanding of payment systems innovations and cybersecurity challenges through the lens of regulators, fintech companies, and incumbents. Today, the Impact Summit at the World fin uh, Fintech Festival here in Budapest, we will be covering topics such as financial inclusion and sustainable finance. But first and foremost, I would like to announce an event celebrating the 50th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic ties between Singapore and Hungary. To honor this occasion, the Central Bank of Hungary has issued a commemorative medal, which will be presented to the public for the first time today. We will also be witnessing the signing ceremony of a cooperation agreement that further strengthens the collaboration between the Monetary Authority of Singapore and the Central Bank of Hungary in the field of digitalization and innovation. I'm pleased to ask the host of this high-level session, Mr. Mihai Potai, Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Hungary, Chairman of the Budapest Stock Exchange and Gyro, that's the automated clearinghouse operator in Hungary, and Vice President of the Hungarian Economic Association, to commence this diplomatic event with his opening speech. Mr. Potay has great experience in the banking sector as well as in finance. Prior to his current position, he was the president of the Hungarian Banking Association and chairman and CEO of Unicredit Bank Hungary. During his career, he has also held a position at the World Bank. Now, please welcome the opening address of Deputy Governor Potay. Good morning, good day, good evening. I warmly welcome all of you at the very first World Fintech Festival in Budapest. Please allow me to express my special gratitude to our distinguished speakers and participants for joining us today. Also, I would like to thank the organizers, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, the Association of Banks in Singapore, and the Singex Holdings for making this event happen despite the global pandemic. We in Hungary are honored to be one of the global satellite partners of this year's festival. In the recent years, we witnessed an emergence of new megatrends. Digitalization and sustainability are among these megatrends, and their role in the current transformation of the world is unquestionable. We can observe how the pandemic has been accelerating the ongoing transformation shaped by these megatrends. Adapting to the technological revolution, embracing and supporting digitalization and promoting a greener and more sustainable economic policy are crucial for overcoming the current crisis and for maintaining and increasing competitiveness for the long run. Due to the pandemic, digital solutions like digital finance, e-governance, e-commerce, telemedicine, home office have become more widespread and digitalization will be the new standard of life in the coming decade and the key to a successful recovery. Furthermore, the digitalization of financial services with an added impetus of COVID-19 has a significant effect on financial inclusion therefore enhances equality and contributes to social welfare and democratizes finances. Given the importance of this matter, financial inclusion will be discussed in depth later on today. The pandemic also underlined the importance of sustainability in both financial and ecological regards. Green policies should be in the forefront of the agenda of governments, businesses, and central banks as well. Our efforts for a greener and more sustainable economy appear on today's agenda as well, as green finance is an integral part of this forward-looking mindset. In the recent years, we observed an expansion in the central bank functions. Going beyond traditional activities, Central banks are among the drivers of digital transformation. 
In the new age of digitalization, it is not sufficient that the regulators understand financial markets in general. They need new skills and techniques to embrace the innovative mindset and to foster cooperation mechanisms among all members of the financial ecosystem. <clears throat> Economic setbacks, <clears throat> as the COVID-19 crisis also provoked central banks to become activists, <clears throat> to look beyond their traditional mandate and keep an eye on full employment, economic stability, and sustainable growth as well. I'm just a second. <clears throat> Close cooperation between central banks and governments proved to be the only way of properly tackling the economic effects of COVID-19. The Central Bank of Hungary was among the first central banks emphasizing the need for close cooperation between government's economic policy and monetary policy while maintaining price stability. Fiscal policy, monetary policy and structural policies must work in harmony in order to support competitiveness and production capacities in the long run. My point to take away is this. The borders between fiscal policy and monetary policy will be fluid. Emphasis will be put on the cooperation of the two. The fintech sector is growing dynamically in the terms of user base, range of products and services, and its financing. Central banks have a responsibility to influence how new players will reshape the financial service landscape and the financial system more broadly. Central banks must drive the digital transformation of the domestic financial system. In accordance with this mindset, the Central Bank of Hungary has launched an instant payment system in early 2020. The system, which is mandatory for all banks operating in Hungary, serves as a basis and an engine for the digital transformation for all actors of the financial system. Central banks also need to step up as supporters of financial innovations and regulators parallelly. And I believe that the new way forward is based on the effective collaboration of central banks, incumbent institutions and fintechs. Central banks and financial supervisors must provide a level playing field for the banking sector and fintech companies. And in closing, our participation at the Singapore Fintech Summit signals that Hungary and Singapore share values in terms of promoting innovation, cooperation and sustainability. From the Central Bank of Hungary's perspective, we reach a new milestone today by, by signing a memorandum of understanding with our Singaporean colleagues, the Monetary Authority of Singapore. I believe this agreement will enable us to further strengthen our cooperation in the field of digitalization and enhance the fintech ecosystem. In this uplifting spirit, I wish you all productive and fruitful discussions. Thank you very much. Mr. Deputy Governor, thank you for your highly appreciated welcoming remarks. And now, as the first guest speaker of this high-level opening session, it is my pleasure to welcome Hungary's Minister of Innovation and Technology, Dr. Laszlo Palkovic. I believe there is no better person than he to talk about Hungary's approach to innovation and technology. Please welcome the speech of Minister Palkovic. Dear ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the invitation. Well, we have uh, uh, unusual days uh, today since uh, we intended to participate at uh, this conference and uh, to talk about uh, the Hungarian digital uh, environment and digital development in person, but unfortunately the virus didn't make it uh, possible. So that's why <coughs> uh, I, will, I will make uh, my contribution uh, via this uh, digital interface. Nevertheless, uh, I think that um, uh, the virus uh, uh, also uh, uh, pointed out that why do we need uh, to uh, develop this kind of systems. Uh, if uh, we would look back 10 years ago, this all would not be possible uh, without having this digital environment. 
Today we talk about uh, things like Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, uh, social networks, big data, blockchain, mobile tools and services and many other things uh, which influence our life and we need to adapt ourselves to this, uh, to this changed environment. That is what is going on also in uh, Hungary and um, uh, uh, the strategy what we uh, developed in 2015, uh, the digital uh, development uh, uh, of uh, the Hungarian ecosystem, uh, contains four major elements. First uh, uh, is the human uh, perspective, uh, the digital competency development for uh, all the age groups starting in kindergarten up to the elderly ages. Infrastructure development, uh, uh, also very important element since the digital age uh, cannot be, uh, can be realized uh, without uh, having the proper infrastructure. I will come back to this point uh, in a minute. Uh, digitization of uh, businesses, <coughs> today the business are not made, is not made or uh, not made like uh, it was made 10 years ago. Uh, and of course the government uh, needs to provide also those services uh, which are available in an electric uh, way. I just would like to introduce you to uh, some of the elements uh, of the Hungarian digital strategies. Um, start with the competency development. Um as I mentioned, uh, we have uh, uh, competency development uh, for each uh, uh, age groups, uh, starting uh, with the digital curriculum, uh, which is a part uh, of the Hungarian uh, national core uh, curriculum uh, already in the primary school, secondary school, of course in the university students are using it already. Uh, we started to have also educational programs uh, for adults because uh, if somebody didn't uh, study this in the school, they need to have a chance uh, to understand it. But uh, this is the same way uh, for elderly people and uh, uh, they are also part of this. Uh, the programs for digital enterprises uh, plays one of the most important uh, role here. And uh, um, since I started with, uh, with the COVID situation, uh, um, we, uh, had, uh, we, we uh, advertised a re-education program uh, in digitalization, in informatics. Uh, it was one of our most successful program during the last few months uh, when uh, the COVID uh, hit uh, also Hungary. Uh, of course, um, uh, we need to have the proper hardware, the proper infrastructure for this. Uh, internet and high-speed communication plays an important role here. Uh, without that, uh, we would not be able to <coughs> have this uh, two-day conversation as well. Uh, Hungary is uh, doing quite uh, well here as far as the super-fast uh, internet uh, development is concerned. Uh, currently, as far as the access to the internet and also the coverage uh, of the high-speed internet in Hungary, uh, we are number six, number seven uh, in the world uh, ranking list and we would like to continue with this. That is the reason that um, we advertise the second phase which is a super fast internet program. Here we talk about the one gigabit uh, per second uh, internet access uh, for uh, the Hungarian households and for the Hungarian uh, uh, institutions. Uh, the investment is pretty huge here but this is an investment where the return on uh, investor will uh, pay back uh, very quickly. Um, uh, the 5G uh, communication development uh, uh, plays an important role here. Better to say the 5G is not only communication, but uh, it uh, offers us uh, uh, totally uh, new opportunities. Uh, here we don't talk only about uh, uh, phone communication uh, or, uh, or access to the internet, uh, but uh, we talk about uh, 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 many other things uh, like machine-to-machine -machine communication, allowing technologies uh, like uh, autonomous vehicles uh, or, or uh, a simple notebook, what, we ha what I have in front of me, but uh, <coughs> to have it in the, in the cloud. Uh, in the 5G developments, Hungary set uh, the target that we would like um, uh, to uh, reach uh, uh, the status that in 2023 uh, all major Hungarian cities will have 5G uh, coverage, total 5G coverage. Uh, and also uh, we set the target that the Hungarian companies were, by the way, Hungary, uh, as far as uh, the high-tech content of the production and the, and the products uh, is, uh, well, number one within the OECD countries together with Germany with 70% content, uh, uh, we would like to reach it until mid of 2023. Currently, Hungary is doing quite well with this. Uh, if uh, we look at uh, the 5G uh, development activities, uh, we are actually on the place three in uh, Europe. Uh, of course, you need to have um, uh, the software uh, to the hardware in order to use all this <coughs> Uh, all these uh, opportunities. Uh, I would like to say some uh, words about the artificial intelligence and the blockchain technologies uh, which add the intellectual content uh, to the previously mentioned uh, uh, hardware elements. Uh, um, Hungary elaborated the artificial intelligence uh, uh, strategy uh, and uh, the government approved it um, uh, a few weeks ago, a few months ago. Uh, we set uh, three major targets. <coughs> First of all, uh, we would like uh, to reach that 15% of the GDP uh, by 2030. 
2030 will be reached by applications in artificial intelligence. 26% uh, of the productivity growth uh, will be supported also by artificial intelligence. And uh, we have the vision that 2030, while building on our high-tech uh, uh, industries, that one million of our uh, citizens uh, will perform new or higher added value job, uh, which was made possible by, uh, by the artificial intelligence. And we also deployed the, the strategy to individual fields, starting for transportation uh, to uh, the energy system up to, up to the healthcare system. Um, the structure of the AI strategy uh, shows uh, um, uh, all the uh, cards of this. Uh, we have uh, foundation pillars uh, where the most important element is uh, starting the data-driven economy uh, and putting it into, into motion. We have made already the first uh, steps of that. Uh, we have also um, defined some uh, specific focus areas um, uh, like manufacturing, like healthcare, agriculture, or pub public administration uh, where these technologies will be promoted by the government and also by the other stakeholders as well. Uh, and also we defined uh, several transformative programs where we need to show to the people uh, that what are the opportunities offered uh, by, uh, by the artificial intelligence in virtually almost all fields uh, of our life, uh, in transportation, in health, in climate uh, research, uh, uh, in uh, data economy and so on. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we already designed this strategy. Uh, we, had, uh, we established a, a coalition called Artificial Intelligence Coalition. Uh, almost 300 participants uh, contributed to this uh, uh, um, uh, 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 strategy. And uh, this strategy was uh, already announced, as you can see on the right-hand side. It's not my person is important, uh, but uh, the one which is standing uh, to the right side uh, of, uh, of the picture, it was uh, a robot uh, who was contributing also to this announcement. So this is all possible today. Blockchain technologies are also playing an important role uh, with the, uh, the leadership of the Central Bank of uh, Hungary. We established a working group, we can call it also as, uh, as a sort of platform uh, for um, the uh, uh, well, uh, development and also usage of uh, the blockchain technologies. And in addition to that, uh, we also joined uh, to the European uh, Blockchain Partnership uh, where uh, the structure is being formed currently. Currently there are several several use cases uh, defined for the European uh, uh, um, uh, cooperation in, in the field of blockchain, uh, like the diplomas, like uh, the self-sovereign identity or trusted data sharing. So Hungary is also part of that. Um, this is the last uh, uh, chart of my presentation because this conference is about uh, digital finance. Uh, I could stop my presentation here and simply saying uh, that what does it mean fintech or digital financing? Uh, this is uh, the conference uh, all about and uh, the, uh, the task for the Hungarian government uh, to provide the necessary environment. That's what I've talked about. And if we look um, what are we doing in this sector, well, besides many other things, uh, <coughs> here uh, the number of the fintech companies, uh, well, uh, already higher than uh, 100. There are European companies, but also Hungarian companies uh, providing local and also cross-border services. The digital government, uh, the digital finance from the government side, uh, taxing, uh, starting from uh, tax filing uh, up to many other things, <coughs> is also a part of that. And uh, in addition to that, um, uh, we have uh, uh, different uh, proactive systems, uh, which are provided by the authorities. So I wish you a uh, good uh, conversation for today. And uh, this was my contribution, uh, what Hungary is doing in this field. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. Thank you, Minister Palkovic, for sharing this valuable information with our global audience. As our next speaker, I'm pleased to announce Hungary's Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Mr. Peter Sijarto. Given the fact that the COVID-19 situation already highlighted the importance of good ties and helping hands between the East and the West, I believe there is no better person to talk about Hungary's openness to further strengthening international business connections. Please welcome Minister Sijarto. First of all, I would like to... Uh express my appreciation um, to the organizers of the World FinTech Festival. First of all, to uh, host this event, uh, regardless of the very complicated circumstances this year. But on the other hand, to include uh, Hungary among the guest countries, that gives us a uh, huge chance to present ourselves and convince the um, FinTech community to think about uh, Hungary more seriously. Uh, than uh, before. We understand that um, the pandemic 
is not only a um, challenge regarding healthcare, but challenge regarding economy as well. We witness a sharp race being launched in the world for the uh, global redistribution of the, um, of the production capacities. Hungary has uh, entered this race and we understand very well that only those countries uh, can be successful in this race uh, who are able to use the technologies of the modern age, namely the financial technology, uh, in a proper uh, manner. We understand the need for digital transformation. That's why we have established our national digitalization strategy, which aims uh, that Hungary should be among the top 10 countries regarding the European Union when it comes to digitalization by the end of this decade. Our fintech strategy has been also established uh, and the aim, main aim of this strategy is that no Hungarian person, citizen, should be prevented from taking advantage of uh, digital competences uh, because of the lack of knowledge in this regard. Our aim is that um, when it comes to online banking, uh, we should reach the EU's average by 2022 and when it comes to the number of digital transactions uh, then uh, it should reach 50% of all transactions. We know that uh, a proper regulatory framework uh, is necessary uh, in this regard. That's why we uh, would like to avoid that costs putting a burden on um, financial transactions would prevent the um, opportunity of innovations uh, to be spread around. And, but, and in the meantime, we would like to um, decrease uh, the use of uh, paper uh, when it comes to uh, bureaucracy uh, and uh, would like to uh, help the paperless solutions to be more uh, widespread. We understood that the financial crisis back in 2008 uh, prevented the financial institutions uh, from uh, <clears throat> spending enough financial resources on research, development and innovation. But now we see the situation has been changed and we are happy as a government to cooperate with the financial institutions <clears throat> here in Hungary to uh, develop new fintech uh, solutions. The uh, most uh, technological uh, innovations apply to the financial uh, transactions. That's why uh, we have approved a uh, strategy which uh, helped to uh, introduce the system of immediate payments and a strong uh, system of veri verification of the customers. Uh, recently, we have introduced a regulation which says that in case of uh, using uh, a credit card uh, while purchasing something, the uh, strong methodology of verification of the customer must be applied. On the other hand, uh, when it comes to immediate uh, payment, those uh, transactions which do not exceed 10 million hoof uh, and are being launched on an electronic basis, uh, will be implemented in five seconds, um, 0 24, the whole day and every day of the year. We understand that uh, one of the consequences of the pandemic is that um, the society, members of the society, are much more present on the digital uh, platforms. And, um, and this, of course, uh, brings uh, some challenges uh, ahead. Uh, in the form of uh, cybercrime, which must be addressed in a uh, proper uh, way. When it comes to the uh, increase of using digital platforms, I can share the following information with you. Following the, uh, the pandemic, um, during the last uh, quarter, it has happened for the first time uh, in Hungary that people have spent more money by using their credit card than the amount of money being taken out uh, from the bankomats. 
and uh, we understand that um, most Hungarian people are happy and ready uh, to use the more secure uh, ways of payment than cash. And according to the study of uh, Deloitte Digital, which has been uh, uh, executed during uh, summer, uh, this phenomenon has uh, accelerated the uh, digitalization uh, in uh, Hungary. Um, back in 2018, 55% of Hungarian customers uh, have managed uh, their issues with the banks, including in exclusively on the spot. Uh, in the local branches of the banks. Now, this has decreased to 19% from 55. The uh, number of uh, omnichannel customers uh, has increased to 46% uh, percent, and the number of the digital or the share of the digital customers has increased from 25 to 36%. Uh, percent. And the, um, the feeling of comfort uh, or in the digital um, platforms has uh, uh, improved uh, by the 24% of the customers as, and has improved significantly by the 26% of the, of the customers. Uh, usually such kind of uh, changes take uh, one, one and a half decades normally, but now the pandemic uh, has such a uh, consequence uh, in this um, uh, regard. From next year uh, onwards, uh, we um, oblige the uh, shops uh, in Hungary to, um, to make it possible for the customers everywhere uh, to be able to, to pay electronically. That means 50, 60,000 new places uh, in this, um, uh, in this um, uh, regard. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this was a short uh, summary in nutshells how Hungary has um, enhanced uh, the uh, fintech related approach uh, here in Central Europe and uh, I would like to express once again uh, our appreciation to the organizers, to the hosts, to uh, invite us and I would like to encourage uh, all entrepreneurs and uh, corporates on the field of fintech to put Hungary into consideration as a location for investments or development activities. The Hungarian government is ready, eager and open to negotiate with you about the possible ways of our future cooperation. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Minister Seattle, thank you for that detailed insight into the current situation in Hungary. And now, as the Singaporean partner of this high-level session, please welcome someone who does not need an introduction. The Chief Fintech Officer at the Monetary Authority of Singapore and the beating heart of the Singaporean Fintech Festival, Mr. Sopnendu Mohanty. His Excellencies, Minister C. Arto, uh, Minister Palkovic, uh, Ambassador Sir Da Hei, Deputy Governor Patai, Chief Digital Officer Samvate, distinguished guest, good morning to everyone joining us from Hungary. I'd like to begin by thanking the Magyar Nemzeti Bank, the Central Bank of Hungary, for organizing this event and giving me the opportunity to deliver my remarks. Thank you also uh, to the Embassy of Hungary in Singapore for coming down to observe the proceedings. Uh, this event is a part of the Singapore FinTech Festival. Uh, now, during this global pandemic, uh, it has forced us to reimagine the way we deliver this festival. And since we have been launching this, fest we launched this festival in 2016, this event has become a global platform where we bring people together to celebrate achievements in FinTech and to connect people and exchange knowledge and ideas. This year, because of the pandemic, we have decided on a hybrid format for the festival. Uh, this combines an online event with other online and physical satellite events around the world. And I was told we're close to 40 plus uh, uh, sites globally where we are all connected and coming together. I'm happy that uh, MNB shares our vision and has pulled together this event to share the knowledge and ideas coming out of Hungary with the rest of the world uh, through the Singapore FinTech Festival. And I was personally in Hungary last year, and I saw the vibrant uh, community out there picking up the, in the space of fintech. Uh, this, this, uh, this, the successful organization of the Buddhist based satellite event today highlights the warm relations between Singapore and Hungary, as well as the strong fintech partnership between MNB and MAS in recent years. 
I am also glad to note that this year marks 50 years of diplomatic relations between our countries. Over 50 years, both the regions have built a strong multifaceted linkages. Uh, EU, EU is ASEAN's second largest trading partner. ASEAN is EU's third largest uh, trading partner. EU in, is also Singapore's top trading partner in services, while Singapore is EU's top ASEAN trading partners in services. Uh, in the area of financial services, FIs from EU and ASEAN have expanded significantly into each other's markets. Uh, one hand, banks and other FIs in EU has grown their reach into the ASEAN and Singapore. On the other hand, Singap uh, Singapore and ASEAN FIs have set their sights on building a strong presence in the EU market as well. Hungary and Singapore are well placed to support the deep financial linkages between the EU and Singapore. We serve each other's node well. Hungary is a hub for trade and businesses in Central and Eastern Europe. Singapore has been an international uh, financial center for business expanding into ASEAN and beyond ASEAN, the whole Asian market in, in generally speaking. And because that's a, we, are a, we are a gateway to the Asian market in, in this part of the world. Therefore, there's a room for both countries to deepen relationship and collaboration in financial services, particularly in fintech. Hungary is one of the fastest growing fintech market in the world. And there has been large uh, push in, in the Central Asian market in this space, and largely due to the foresight and ambition of the MNB in identifying fintech as the key growth area. MS has been keenly, en keenly engaging with the MNB to see how we can help each other to grow the pie and better leverage technology to deliver a smarter, more efficient, and more inclusive financial sector in our countries. That is why the MNB and the MAS have decided to enter into a fintech cooperation agreement. The agreement sets out the framework for collaborating between these two central banks, which includes referral mechanism for us to refer fintech companies that are looking to access each other's market. And MNB and MAS will also explore joint innovation projects in areas such as payment, settlement system, AI, machine learning, and distributed ledger technology. We also commit to share information on financial sector innovation. This, agre this agreement will strengthen the foundation for us to bilaterally cooperate, in, uh, bilaterally cooperate in fintech and also helps us to deepen the ecosystem from both sides as we expand to each other market. Deputy Governor Patai and I have been discussing this since last year, so I'm very glad to use this opportunity here at the Budapest satellite event today to sign the, to, 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 to sign the uh, FinTech Cooperation Agreement. I'm, I'm certain that today's event is just one of many future collaboration between the MNB and MAS. With that, I'd like to conclude my remark, and I hope you enjoy the event as well as the rest of Singapore FinTech Festival. Have a fruitful week ahead and stay safe. Thank you, Mr. Mohanty, for your positive, constructive thoughts. And now it's my pleasure to welcome you to the online session of the World Fintech Festival Magic. in Budapest, where a special commemorative medal will be presented. The Central Bank of Hungary will issue a particularly large, silver-coated, non-ferrous metal commemorative medal to honour the fact that Hungary established diplomatic relations with Singapore 50 years ago. I hope everyone is excited as I am about revealing this beautiful medal. Please welcome Mihai Potai, Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Hungary, who will offer a detailed presentation of this commemorative medal. His Excellency Minister Sijartu, His Excellency Minister Palkovic, Mr. Sopendu Mohanty, His Excellency Ambassador Serdehei, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Central Bank of Hungary, I would like to welcome you to the World Fintech Festival in Budapest. 2020 proved to be an irregular year in many respects, but this is also special in the history of Singaporean and Hungarian relations, since this year we celebrate the 50th anniversary of establishing diplomatic relations between the two countries. Hungary's cooperation with Singapore is based on mutual respect and friendship. Being open economies, both countries are ardent supporters of free and fair international trade and global economy. 
On the occasion of this 50th anniversary, the Central Bank of Hungary produced and issued an exclusive piece of remembrance, a particularly large silver-coated commemorative medal with a diameter of 100 millimeters in a very limited edition. These special medals strive to display all our common values, respect for traditions, sustainability and partnership. In this spirit, on the obverse, Hungarian and Singaporean motifs are featured, balancing one another in a harmonious thematic connection. In the upper third of the coin side, the national flags representing the two countries' diplomatic relations are shown. Right below, the number 1970 refers to the year when diplomatic relations were established. In the upper legend, linked to the national flags, the letterings Hungary and Singapore are featured in the country's official languages, in Hungarian and in English. On the right of the obverse, the representation of the flower of the modern city-state, the Singaporean orchid is seen. This flower representation is artistically linked to the tulip, appearing as a Hungarian folk art motif, the symbol of tree of life. The modern articulation of folk art motifs nicely combines the respect for tradition with modern style. In addition to respect for tradition, sustainable development is also a value of key importance in Singapore, and it is symbolized well by the solar-powered super trees in nature parks, gardens by the bay, which reduce the greenhouse effect and collect rainwater. Their representation is shown within the landscape on the reverse. The Hungarian side is represented by the Ibl Creative House Buddha in the house built in the 19th century in a style of mimicking the Renaissance, function is combined with art. The historical landmark building currently functions as a cultural meeting place. I believe that this commemorative medal expresses our common values and great cooperation. Please let me close with quotes from two gentlemen who had made a difference. First of all, Lee Kuan Yew, the first Prime Minister of Singapore, and former minister mentor of Singapore. A quote, I am very determined. If I decide that something is worth doing, I shall put my heart and soul to it. The whole ground can be against me, but if I know it's right, I shall do it. That's the business of a leader, unquote. And the Nobel Prize winner, Albert Sengyörgyi, quote, see what everyone can see and think no one has sold before, unquote. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Governor. And I must say that the commemorative medal is truly beautiful indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending the event where the commemorative medal to honor the 50th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between Singapore and Hungary was officially presented. And now over to Singapore, where, at the request of the Central Bank of Hungary, Dr. Istvan Serdahe, Hungary's ambassador to Singapore, will hand over a complimentary medal to Mr. Sopnandu Mohanty, Chief Fintech Officer at the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Thank you, Dr. Serdahe and Mr. Mohanty. The fast-developing professional cooperation between the Monetary Authority of Singapore and the Central Bank of Hungary can be further enhanced along the lines of the cooperation agreement, since the two authorities can speed up the international expansion of international businesses and launch common innovation projects for the promotion and application of cutting-edge technologies. Please welcome the Chief Digital Officer at the Central Bank of Hungary, Ms. Onikor Sombati, and the Chief Fintech Officer at the Monetary Authority of Singapore, Mr. Sopnandu Mohanty, to sign the cooperation agreement. 
Thank you very much, Miss Somebody and Mr. Mohanty. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll now be taking a short break as we hear from our partners, and we'll be back in three minutes' time as we continue with a keynote speech as part of today's program on financial inclusion. See you then.
Azt gondolom, hogy ez az épület mondjuk az ország egyik legjelentősebb műemléke. A régészeti ástársnak az eredményei adtak arra reményt, hogy esetleg el lehet dönteni, hogy tényleg itt volt a középkor óta a városháza, úgyhogy a kihívás az abszolút megvolt. Az épület megújításával kapcsolatosan alapvetően három feladatunk volt. Az egyik feladat az egy műemléki rekonstrukció, a másik nagy feladat csoport az az volt, hogy a XXI. századtól elvárható technikai berendezések, gépészet, hogy kerüljön úgy be ebbe a házba, hogy a lehető legkevesebbet lásson ebből után egy látogató. És a harmadik feladat az, az pedig mindig az épület bővítése volt. Az ország egyik legemblematikusabb területének legemblematikusabb épülete újjá születik. Ez, ez valóban egy nagyon fontos szimbólummal és jelentőséggel bír. A földszint és a pince szint az mindenki számára megnyitott, turisták, városlakok számára megnyitott gyakorlatilag közönségforgalmi terekből fog állni, és az emelet, illetve a tetőtér, az pedig olyan részben oktatási, részben reprezentatív előadó tereket fogad be, amelyek mondjuk a nagy közönség elől zártak, vagy ellenőrzött terek. A XXI. században rendkívül fontos szerepe és jelentősége van a tudásnak, a kreativitásnak és az innovációnak. Az egyik legfontosabb cél, hogy egy olyan oktatási tudásközpont jöjjön létre a Szent Háromság téren, amely valóban az értékekről, az érték teremtésről, az érték őrzésről és a tudás megosztásról szól. Geopolitics, History, Economics. The book titled American Empire vs. European Dream by Gerd Matolci, the governor of the Central Bank of Hungary, has been released. Providing a broad perspective, it analyzes the process of how the American Empire became the world's number one superpower, what motivations other major players in geopolitics had, how the European Union attempted to compensate the hegemon status of the American Empire, and how the European dream shattered at the dawn of a new world order. You can find the answers to these questions, as well as many important and topical issues, in Gyurgy Matolci's new book, which has already achieved international success. The book is available in bookstores or online in the webshop of Paulos Atene Publishing House 
or on Amazon.com.
Ladies and gentlemen, the next session of today's event will focus on financial inclusion in the digital age. Our keynote speaker in this session will answer the question, the fintech conundrum. Does increasing inclusion for some mean increasing exclusion for others? The topic will be addressed by the director of the Cambridge Centre for Alternative Finance, Dr. Robert Wardrop. Bob is a professor in management practice on the faculty of the Cambridge Judge Business School, where he teaches in the MBA and the Master of Finance programs. He is also the founding director of the Cambridge Centre for Alternative Finance, a world-leading research centre studying the global development of digital financial services. He is the academic program director of the Centre's Cambridge Fintech and Regulatory Innovation Online Program, which has enrolled financial services regulators and policymakers from more than 100 countries. Bob, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much. I, I hope you can hear me okay. And I'm going to spend the next sort of 15 minutes talking about what I would describe as the no free lunch question. So, of course, when we talk about fintech innovation, there's a lot of enthusiasm in it, and there's growing evidence, which I'll, I'll talk about shortly and illustrate, regarding the positive impact that fintech innovation has on financial inclusion. But the real question that has occurred to me, particularly over the past sort of six to 12 months, is that it also introduced risk of exclusion, particularly as we've gone through the COVID period. And I'm gonna talk about that with respect to some of our emerging research, but also some personal observations that I've made with respect to my own personal life and my, my family, actually. So first of all, I'm, today's talk, I'm going to cover kind of three basic areas. Again, and as I referred to earlier, I'm going to talk a little bit about the fintech impact on financial inclusion. Secondly, the importance of COVID and the impact on, I would call, fintech adoption or the rate of adoption of digital financial services that have been a product of that innovation. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the exclusion risks that I see may be emerging. And most importantly, perhaps, what can be done to mitigate those risks? So while there may be no free lunch, in other words, the risk of exclusion emerges as we achieve higher levels of financial inclusion, it's not a complete trade-off. There are things I think we can do to help that balance weight towards inclusion much more than increasing exclusion. So let's start with just a basic overview of financial inclusion. So Financial inclusion, I think, has really come onto the radar screen. It's a core regulatory objective of many jurisdictions. I'm showing here just a very simple graph to show regionally the shift in account ownership in Europe and Central Asia. So we see um, the blue bar would be sort of 2011. Uh, the gray bar would be the most recent data from the Findex data that sort of tracks um, individuals that own accounts, so a transaction accounts, right? Um, which are, um, are not necessarily bank accounts. A bank account certainly is a transaction account, but where the impact of fintech has been most profound is broadening that definition of account, because obviously a mobile money account through which you can make payments, for example, is a transaction account. So that's the proxy we typically use for financial inclusion is account ownership. And what we see in some of these regions, the South Caucasus, for example, uh, or Eastern Europe, significant increases in financial inclusion as people acquire transaction accounts, whereas you know, in Northern Europe, Western Europe, sort of almost 100% of those populations have had accounts. Now, we see evidence clearly of the powerful impact of, say, these transaction accounts, these non-traditional bank accounts when we take a look at Sub-Sahara Africa. So what I'm showing here in the graph is different financial products made available over mobile money networks in Sub-Sahara Africa, and uh, we see the, the gold or yellowish um, bars, which represent Mshwara, which is a savings product in Kenya. If you remember, M-Pesa, of course, which is the poster child uh, of mobile money payment systems, uh, people often cite as an example of financial inclusion. You see other kinds of financial services like Mshwara, savings accounts, the growth in the registration of those accounts for savings increasing dramatically between 2012 and 2018. And as other countries followed with similar mobile money systems, you see the growth similarly, but lagging Kenya. So this is fintech innovation clearly illustrated as having impact. And when we talk to you know, regulators, this is some work we did with the World Bank back in 2019, we really wanted to understand the regulator perspective on whether they felt 
you know, financial inclusion was being positively impacted by these sort of non-traditional transaction accounts or what we call alternative finance channels. And what we see here, financial inclusion specifically very highly rated, right? So in other words, the, the, the dark blue indicates positive impact when you take kind of the, the um, positive impact, the majority, but you know, there's other categories related to financial inclusion. If we go up to say, uh, you know, consumer access to finance, well, you could argue that's a you know link to financial inclusion, and certainly SME access to finance. So when we talk about inclusion, we also also talk about not just fully excluded communities, but also underserved communities. Now, that kind of sets the context. But what has happened with COVID? COVID's had a very powerful impact. Now. It was mentioned earlier in the introduction that I, I lead a program. We have cohorts of about 150 regulators uh, three times a year. It really trains them in adapting and developing financial regulation, developing frameworks for understanding fintech innovation to inform the regulatory change they can make in response to changes in business model and technology. Okay, And so I, I often, in the weekly sessions that are live, I pull the regulators. I ask them a pertinent question. In April, I asked them this question. I said, how do you think the rate of adoption of digital financial services in your country will change due to COVID-19? You see very strong views expressed. It's going to increase the rate of adoption. Okay, Some reasonable portion saying staying the same, no one's saying decrease. I asked the same question in October when it was becoming very, very clear that COVID was having a powerful impact. And what you see is, of course, that increase, those that believe it's going to increase the rate of adoption much stronger. And, you know, when we step back and think about why, well, look, there were really interesting, particularly around payments. Our research has shown us that payments, mobile payments, online pay, payments behavior shifted dramatically. This is just an example from Pakistan. These are weekly mobile payment volumes. You can see here week by week, starting before the lockdown happened in March in Pakistan. You had about 313 million during the week of lockdown. Uh, of, of payments flowing over mobile payment networks. But go to the right to the week of May 1st, all of a sudden, 60% increase, $582 million. And what you can see is the transaction numbers going up. And it's not just because people had an aversion to cash. I think it's important to recognize that there were regulatory measures that kicked in to facilitate that behavioral shift. I'm going to talk about those a little bit more later. In fact, what we saw in our research we published recently with the World Bank was the more stringent, the regulatory measures with respect to lockdown, the bigger the shift in payments and other adoption of fintech-driven services during the pandemic period, because regulators effectively accommodated behavior shift in relation to the severity of the lockdown. Now, there's another very important trend that I think we need to be cognizant of, which is absolutely accelerated during COVID. And this is what I call the acceleration in the embedding of financial services. And by embeddedness, what I mean is that financial services are being embedded in other services. And this chart, this diagram sort of illustrates and uses technology firms as an analogy for this. We go to the left. We see five different verticals, financial services, technology, telecoms, energy manufacturing, distinct verticals. Tech was a distinct vertical before the internet era. But we go to the middle set, right? Post-internet, tech became embedded in everything. It became foundational in other verticals. And in fact, the S&P 500 recategorized tech firms about two years ago. Many firms that were referred to as being in the tech index were moved out and actually put in communications. So the number of firms today that we actually call tech firms is shrinking because tech is embedded in every firm. If we go to the right, our argument here is that the same is happening with financial services. Financial services is being embedded in other verticals, in telecommunications that may be the mobile payments, for example, uh, like I referred to earlier with M-Pesa, or it may be pay-as-you-go energy systems that is developing across much of the developing world, or in manufacturing, maybe transfers of value in IoT systems. Cleared by blockchain, I, I heard a discussion of blockchain initiatives earlier as we opened this program. So financial services like tech are becoming an enabler, shifting horizontally and being embedded in other verticals. And this is very important when we start to think about where the emergent areas of potential exclusion are. 
And let's talk about where some of those areas are and maybe how, how they could be mitigated. Now, there was a, a, a pretty interesting paper done a few years ago by, by CGAP. Uh, and if you haven't, many of you may or may not be familiar with CGAP's data. They do terrific work, very closely linked with the World Bank. And they, they began to sort of understand issues around fraud and particularly mobile financial services. And they list a number of different areas of risk. But I think some of those risks are highly relevant to what I would call potential exclusion risk. And I would categorize three key areas of risk that I suspect are emerging. One is channel risk. As I switch from, let's say, a non-digital channel as a user to a digital channel user, I'm dealing with a new interface. I'm dealing with the unfamiliar. And that can have reactions I'll talk about a little bit earlier that I think can lead to exclusion. Second, I think there's customer and compliance risk. If I'm an individual who is dependent on sort of informal economy transactions, perhaps I, I'm not using digital channels today. To use digital channels, to get that transaction account I need, because remember, as digital channels become more prevalent, there's going to be a, a, a reduction in the availability of other channels, non-digital channels. So if I need to satisfy KYC due diligence requirements, to join the digital channel ecosystem, can I? And that really is an area around managing customer and compliant risk, because if I can't satisfy those requirements, I can't join. The third area is in regulatory supervision and enforcement, very squarely in the realm of regulators. And it has to do with system trust, because I think if new risks emerge, and our research has shown significant emerging risk with respect to cyber through COVID, expressed, by the way, both on the part of fintech firms as well as regulators. If, it's, if, it, if you don't have visibility on that emergent risk, on that malfeasance, and you can't enforce on it, there's a risk of compromising system trust. And individuals will not adopt digital channels as just as a sociological cognitive issue if they do not have trust in the system that they're engaging in for the first time. They just won't adopt. So how do we address each of these? I want to talk about channel risk first. I think we need to move away from strictly defining financial inclusion in the context of access. In other words, do I have access to a transaction account? In other words, do I have a transaction account? It's actually about usability. Both are potential drivers of exclusion, right? I think, and when I talked earlier about the personal perspective I have on this, to be frank, I think of my mother. My mother is in her 80s. She lives in Canada. My mother, very cognit you know, cognitively functioning, she doesn't have an email account. In fact, she doesn't have a, a computer. She doesn't have an iPad. She just got a simple phone, which is not a smartphone, at the insistence of her children. And so if you want to reach my mother, you basically need to call. And she never turns it on. You need to call my mother on her fixed line phone or you can't reach my mother. Now, my mother pays her rent with a check. She signs a piece of paper, walks out of her apartment, goes somewhere and deposits it. Now, checks represent 2% of payments and shrinking in Canada today. When So when checks disappear, what does my mother do? Now, this is in a highly, highly developed economy. My mother has access to the financial system. My mother has an account. She can go to the bank and take out money in the local bank branch. But if that bank branch closes and she migrates to a mobile channel, I am not certain that my mother will understand how to actually access that channel, use that channel, and execute transactions. What my mother needs is technology literacy. And so historically, when we talked about bringing people into the financial system, we talked about financial literacy, possessing the skills that allow people to make informed decisions with their money. My mother understands what a loan is. She understands what debt is. She understands what budgeting is. Her problem is technology literacy. So there are vulnerable groups that need to adopt technology knowledge in addition to financial knowledge. Second, with respect to customer and compliance risk, absolutely regulatory support from regulators is required. Regulators can adopt regulatory compliance obligations, revising their frameworks to support EKYC. There are examples out there. If they're not introduced, it's going to be very difficult to migrate large numbers of people onto 
uh, mobile channels. And, and this is research we published with the World Bank, which we published about two weeks ago, where fintechs, they're providing payments, providing are, are imploring regulators for more support in terms of onboarding, customer due diligence, and EKYC. Or they can't bring people into the systems, the channels that have accelerated adoption during the COVID period. And finally, some of this falls directly on regulators to up their game in terms of supervision. I think it's, it's you know, a lot of talk about subtech, but to mitigate the risk of exclusion, to support the development of system trust that is going to migrate behaviors of people who are not 18 year olds old and familiar with a smartphone to migrate from the way they interact and pay and borrow today to new systems, you, you need to move to new forms of supervision and new ways of collecting data to provide visibility on where you need to enforce. This is an example from the Philippines, I won't go into it in great detail, about a chatbot that was developed where any consumer can simply send in an example of malfeasance or a complaint with a backend system that can sort and process that data to highlight areas using machine learning where enforcement action deserves more human attention and action. It's through these kinds of mechanisms, new technologies, where individuals, just consumers, or shifting their behaviors are going to shift their behaviors with confidence as a result of system trust. So with that, I'm going to summarize by saying, I think, a few simple points. Number one, we do have substantial evidence that fintech innovation has positively impacted financial inclusion. That's abundantly clear. The, the impact of that is being brought forward as a result of this COVID accelerated adoption phenomenon. Digital financial services are much more broadly deployed today than they were six or nine or 12 months ago. And that opens up these areas of exclusion risk. And we need to mitigate them to maximize the impact and harvest the benefit of fintech innovation. And I'm suggesting there are these three areas focusing on technology literacy in addition to financial literacy, providing targeted areas of regulatory support for digital financial services, particularly in onboarding, and deploying new subtech tools by regulators to increase the visibility on malfeasance, on fraud, uh, areas of, of risk emerging that consumers are being impacted by to enable enforcement and build confidence. And with that, I thank you for listening. Thank you, Bob, uh, for that passionate and strong keynote address regarding the burning issue of where financial inclusion really begins and what challenges we must still address. Ladies and gentlemen, the Impact Summit in Budapest continues with a panel discussion titled Financial Inclusion, How to Build a Digital Ecosystem. And as the title suggests, its central question is how digitalization can accelerate financial inclusion and what specific challenges COVID-19 has brought about in this area. Joining me on this virtual stage as the moderator of this session is Ms. Traman Guyan, the co-founder of CFTE, the Centre for Finance, Technology and Entrepreneurship, one of the fastest growing learning and innovation platforms in fintech and in digital finance. Traman is an advocate of lifelong learning and continuous education as the best tool to help organisations and people adapt to a fast-changing world. She is passionate about upskilling and providing more opportunities to professionals in finance, as well as providing women and individuals from diverse backgrounds with a voice. Traman, the floor is yours to introduce your panel. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. And good afternoon. Uh, good evening. Uh, good afternoon from London. Uh, evening from Vietnam. And good, good hello for everyone. First, before we start, let me congratulate. Uh, Maya Nelsinti Bank, the Central Bank of Hungary, and MS for a very special moment. I would like to share how honored we are today to be part of this event. Thank you for this great opportunity to join this event, and thank you for the great partnership. Let me welcome our four speakers. We'll be discussing about financial inclusion and how to build a digital ecosystem. I would like to welcome first Ronit. 
Global Sector Head for Bank Research, co-head of the FinTech Group and head of MINA Research for City. Ronit is the lead author for City's GPS Bank of the Future and FinTech Report from Dubai. He is also an advisory board of CFT. I would like to very welcome Ms. Aniko Tsombati as well. You know, thanks very much, uh, Aniko, for organizing this event and being part of this panel. Uh, Aniko is the Chief Digital Officer, Executive Director for Digitalization and FinTech Development and member of the Financial Stability Council of Mania Nemzeti Bank, the Central Bank of Hungary. Aniko's main responsibility is to promote digital transformation in the financial sector as well as within the central bank, including the implementation of cutting edge technologies and supporting the fintech ecosystem. I'm also very happy to welcome Ms. Leslie Ann Vogen, Director of Product Strategy of Mulaju Foundation. Leslie Ann has been working in emerging market digital financial services innovation since 2005. She was part of the founding team behind MPESA. In recent years, she has worked as a freelance consultant for various organizations involving in the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, consulting group to assist the poor, and IIEC, Microsoft, and MasterCard. And I'm very honored also to welcome Manisha Shah. Manisha is the CFO of Momo, Vietnam's leading e-wallet company. As part of the senior management team, her responsibility includes the finance, human resources, communal raising, and investor relation. And today, we'll start with the panel discussion on financial inclusion. So let me start uh, with the first topic about the relevance of financial inclusion in your various you know, current position. Um, and perhaps I will start with Runit. Um, and Runit, in a recent study, with the banking, the next billion euro, the report that you, you produce, City estimates that financial inclusion will grow uh, in a big way. Run it in your opinion. What are the drivers of this growth? And what are the main, the, the other main conclusions of the study? Sure. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Traman. Um, a figure that most people are aware of is 1.7 billion. That's the number that's often quoted about the excluded, the unbanked. The 1.7 billion number comes from a World Bank report in 2018, referring to data in 2017. Um, that number, if you went back to 2014, was about 2 billion. Now, we estimated in the report you mentioned, Traman, that we estimated that number would fall further. We thought that by 2022, the number would be closer to 1 billion. So we've, the first point I want to make is that we've, we've lived through an amazing period of inclusion or growth in um, financial penetration, financial inclusion. And this is important, not just because we want everyone to have a bank account, it's important from a social welfare perspective. Financial inclusion allows better economic growth. It allows, particularly in the lower part of the pyramid, for people to be able to build businesses get some more security, and access potentially savings and credit. So Thanks. Thanks. the numbers are growing. It's important that it's growing. Thanks, Renit. Leslie Ann, uh, Mojalu Foundation's mission is to increase financial inclusion by empowering organizations, creating payment system to enable digital financial services for all. Leslie Ann, on What's the role of Molaju and how can you increase financial inclusion? And perhaps what are the challenges for creating this, uh, these payments uh, um, the, and, and, and the challenges that you see for the different payments model? Thanks, Tram. So I start the story with M-Pesa because it's a big part yes. of my story in the background. Um, M-Pesa is a big part of the financial inclusion story globally. It created an industry around it. And the reality is that 50% of the world's population are offline. And MPESA solves the problem of giving people back their time. The agent network is fundamental, as well as enablement of feature phone payment enablement, not smartphones. But obviously, they're moving into smartphones now as well. So that moment when mobile money customers need to interact with the traditional banking infrastructure, it's often enabled by bilateral connections, deals, and interconnection, and that works well to start with. So 
that is the story of Amshwari that we heard from Bob in the early um, connection. What Amshwari led to is a Kenya loans and saving marketplace that connected M-Pesa to all of the banks in, in Kenya. But the reality is that to make this happen at scale everywhere else with other markets, bilateral deals and technology enablement has the potential to be very inefficient. Often consumer protection will suffer when things go wrong. Issues can take days to fix. And in the meantime, a low-income customer is suffering from their money being completely inaccessible. And there's also a reason to have credit bureaus in the conversation. Um, something like a mishwari, if you're not thinking about how much credit someone is having. And then often when we talk about payment switches, entities such as microfinance organizations, SACOs and mobile money operators are not part of the conversation. And yet they're vital in bringing services to the last mile. So Modulate Foundation is a, a new foundation that was funded this, founded this year. It's to support the long range development and enhancement of some open source software that is a real-time push payments enablement model that enables non-bank and bank players to collaborate together with an interconnect API that's been designed for the fact that we've got different KYC tiers and different decisions have to be made um, at the point of the transaction. It also focuses on removing uncertainty and reconciliations of manual transactions. We've got a mindset of co-creation on shared services enablement in the co-opetition space. We focus on rails enablement and we use cryptographic controls using the interledger protocol to avoid repudiation of transfers and ensure that clearing is final and um, so that the money doesn't get stuck when it comes to customer funds. We focus on an asynchronous design that helps deal with the network realities of emerging markets. We know that networks are not that stable. <laughs> and so we should we hope at the back of our design decisions that we've actually created something that is very useful to um, players in emerging markets who want to create interconnect between different systems in a reliable way that works for financial inclusion ecosystem we have partners in the foundation for example from um, google through to gates foundation both public private and donor sector are a big part of the conversation thanks manisha we hear, you know, a lot about Momo, and please, can you tell us, you know, about the organization and perhaps how Momo is supporting financial inclusion in Vietnam and how have you developed with the current uh, pandemic? Sure. Thanks, Shanghan. It's a pleasure to be on this panel today. So uh, Momo is the largest e-wallet platform in Vietnam. Today, we have 20 million users and over 25,000 merchants and an Asian network that Leslie was talking about across the country. You know, Momo was founded, you know, today people talk a lot about e-wallets and, and unicorns and fintech, but Momo was founded uh, in 2007 when they store, saw the story of M-Pesa. It was founded with a single, it's called, Momo is, means mobile money. It was founded with the vision of using the mobile phone to improve financial inclusion and provide more financial services to Vietnamese people, to ordinary Vietnamese people. And, and that remains the goal of the business today. We moved, as Leslie was also you know, referencing, from feature phones to smartphones very early. We moved about 2015, when we saw that actually that's where the users in Vietnam were moving. And, you know, so, so we, we have now uh, e-wallet app. To, so in terms of financial inclusion, look, all in Vietnam, we have a rule that all the bank accounts have to be linked. E-wallets have to be linked to bank accounts. So in that way, we are at the moment limited to the, to the world of people that have bank accounts. However, I think it's important to note that a lot of the people that have bank accounts in our country, they are underbanked. So just because you have a bank account doesn't mean you actually have access to a broad suite of financial services or that you can use it. So we start with going with bank customers, helping under bank users get online, use have better access to their money, use that money for a broad array of services, everything from sending money to people to, to you know, buying insurance, paying for hospital or school bills, uh, et cetera. And we also started working, you know, more recently during COVID, the EKYC 
a rule was passed by the regular government, and that's forming a basis of what we hope will be an, our opportunity to work with banks to bring the other 70% of Vietnamese people that don't have bank accounts online. And we believe that the mobile channel is ideal to do that with. Thanks. <laughs> I would like to ask Aniko for further your, her views, but certainly not least, we, we have also you know, the, the views from the central bank. Uh, and Aniko, what is the role of central banks in increasing financial inclusion? And what are the main challenges uh, you see regulators, especially you know, the central bank of Hungary face today? Thank you, Traman. Uh, actually, the role of central banks as uh, issuers of legal tender and overseers of uh, payment system stability is twofold. First, they have to ensure that in any chosen form, payments are transacted smoothly, safe and secure. On the other hand, in terms of financial inclusion, they also have the role to promote as a to more and more people should have access to modern, safe and affordable financial services that best serve their personal economic goals. And uh, connected to Manisha, I would also underline that having a bank account itself is not enough. Uh, based on a recent OECD study just uh, published this summer, uh, for example, in Hungary, the uh, average uh, Financial knowledge is uh, satisfactory. Uh, however, the implementation capacity is below average, meaning that in real life situations, people are uh, not uh, making uh, financial planning or saving decisions, or at least not making it consciously. So on top of that, uh, the digital skills and the utilization in uh, complex financial decisions uh, are also interrelated, uh, meaning that uh, when uh, these uh, decisions are made, uh, people with most advanced financial knowledge are making the decision based on uh, information from the digital channels. So not only financial, but digital literacy have to be improved as well. Yes, no, thanks, Aniko. And that, you know, uh, go back to, uh, to my second topic, which is how can digitalization speed up financial uh, inclusion? I will ask, you know, all of you, you know, to share about what you see from the opportunities and the challenges. And as, you know, Aniko, you mentioned about, uh, um, you know, improving uh, the literacy, can you continue, uh, you know, talking with Aniko, the modern world requires modern tools, as you say, to improve financial inclusion. In what unique ways intend the central bank improve financial literacy uh, of specific customer group? You Could you share more about why have you chosen the 814 age group to target and why your initiative is so unique? Thank you. So we just launched our uh, central bank uh, one-of-a-kind free mobile app uh, aiming a to, uh, 18, 8 to 14 years old uh, school students. And our aim was to establish uh, those uh, uh, financial behaviors that can be uh, adopted also in the early age, the regular saving habits and uh, setting financial goals. And on top of that, uh, with the help of the constantly renewing uh, quizzes, we also help uh, children and families to acquire up-to-date uh, financial sustainability and digital skills. So how the application is working? Actually, first, uh, children has to set up a financial goal, a saving goal. They can pick up uh, savings uh, targets from a catalog uh, containing toys, little gadgets, and so on. Uh, and uh, when they are successfully answering the quizzes that are constantly renewed, they can randomly earn uh, digital medals. 
these, these medals are forming series, uh, for example, based on famous Hungarian kings or castles. So these have to be collected. And for the collection, they have to exchange with each other. The exchange is facilitated by QR code uh, generation. And at the end of the savings period, uh, they can uh, uh, collect the earned uh, presents uh, by uh, making a purchase in a special web shop. And uh, these presents will be delivered to their own schools. We picked up this age group especially because uh, this is the first, uh, first uh, period when uh, uh, children already have some pocket money, so they have some spending. But this spending is uh, taking place uh, exclusively in cash. While, on the other hand, most of these children already have uh, smartphones, uh, but they are legally deprived of having their own bank cards. Very great initiative. No, thanks. Ronit, um, you are in the Middle East, you see a lot around the world, but you're also you know, in, in the Middle East today. And how, in your point of view, how can digitalization speed up financial inclusion? What digital financial services do you think can reach really poor people first? And are fintechs really able to bridge the current gaps in terms of access and minimum balances that keep entire region currently away from financial services? Why are the same problems present in more advanced economies as well? Could you please share with us? Sure. Um, so one of the problems you have is access to formal bank accounts. So digital wallets, mobile wallets become really important simply to provide security and moving money around. Uh, Leslie Ann will obviously know this much better than me and probably Manisha as well, but MNOs, telecom companies, play a very important role and have done for the last 15 years in the region, uh, particularly in East Africa, and just getting money around. So the first, for me, the first use case that um, digital sort of broadly defined provides is moving cash safely and cheaply rather than paying an intermediary, running the risk with the, the proverbial bus driver, uh, just moving money is the first, first advantage. The, the second one is, um, and this is where maybe more recent fintechs come in, is the idea of fractionalization. Because one of the challenges you have if you're a lower income worker or even a young person in an advanced society like the US or Europe is being able to access, access instruments or assets that have high denomination values. You want to buy one share of you know, ABC company, or you want to buy even one government bond, right? You know, there's, there's usually the safest asset in your country, a risk-free asset. To buy one government bond in, a, in an African or Middle Eastern country could be very expensive. You may not have the money, but fintechs can fractionalize that or sachetize it, sachetize, can't even pronounce the word. Um, and that, 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 that becomes a real advantage, whether it's in emerging markets or in developed markets. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks, Rick. Manisha, you are in Vietnam. You see a lot from, you know, Asia and Vietnam perspective. Could you specify the stage of Momo and what's the speed of uh, financial inclusion? Perhaps, you know, what can you share the challenges that you face in Vietnam mm -hmm. and what can we learn and leverage to other countries? Sure, I, it, it's hard for me to define where we are in terms of financial inclusion. As, as I said to you a little bit before, we're at about 30% of Vietnamese people have bank accounts. Of that, people who actively use banks, well, let me 30% have about bank accounts, credit card penetration is 5% or under. So, so I would say we are still at the earlier stages. I think there is a very, very strong directive from, the, from both the government as well as the State Bank of Vietnam to promote digital payment. There is a strong, strong focus on that. The government and the regulators are simultaneously very cautious because they, they want to protect the individuals from fraud. So, you know, if you think from the central bank perspective, they are trying to, to manage both those things. They want to promote digital payments. They want to promote, you know, more, more uh, bank penetration. They want to control the risk of people losing assets. So I think that that's sort of, you know, broadly the macro environment in Vietnam. I think that 
the, the way to, to increase financial inclusion in Vietnam, what I have learned is that you don't think about it as a game for fintechs or banks or regulators or somebody else. You think of it as something that you have to do together. So Momo is a platform business. It has access very easily to millions of customers, access to merchants, but we need banks, but we need the regulator and the government. So I, I think what I have learned in Vietnam is that it is critical that you work with all old economy, new economy, state regulators together. And without doing that effectively, you cannot solve the challenge of financial inclusion. You know, we, we see a lot of press that, you know, the fintech is going to do everything, cannot do it alone. That, that I think is my, is personally my biggest lesson. And I think usually everyone is aligned to increase financial inclusion. They just have maybe different problems that they are trying to solve at the same time. And if you understand those problems, you speed up the trajectory of inclusion. Yeah, no. Thanks. Thanks, Manisha. Manisha. I see. I see. You know, coming to the topic of how can digitalization speed up financial inclusion, what do you see as the opportunities and the challenges? Um, can you share, you know, why is it important that Mojalo is open source? Uh, and what other technology uh, features can give major inputs to the to the spread of these uh, digital uh, payments? Um, uh, you know, even in extremely low income region, what's your what's your view on this? So I want to amplify what Manisha just said. Really, um, we will get financial inclusion when we get more collaboration, mm. and and actually we can sit in a room and we can talk for days and weeks and months and years and still not have something actually in the hands of users. Mm. Um, so the moment of having an open source code base as a collaboration point is a way for us to actually move the conversation forwards, accelerate it through examples and to really start to understand each other from different perspectives and try things. The big part of the benefits of open source is that moment of a co-creation environment um, to apply the approach to regulation innovation, um, to have public and private collaboration through the concept of rules as code and, and regulation as code, um, I think it can be very effective in, in moving the conversation forward, for example, around privacy by design, shared and fraud risk management services, regtech, subtech, in the context of financial inclusion realities. Let's bring those realities to the table. Um, there's a newly launched Digital Public Good Alliance um, it's it's actively sourcing open source initiatives in parallel industries as well as us at the Modulate Foundation. So there's a movement, um, MOSIP are in the identity space, um, and it's based out of individuals from the ADAR India stack. There's Open G2P that came out of um, the Ebola crisis um, and beneficiary management, those kind of things. And um, what we want to do is actually figure out how to put these systems together in an open source collaborative way and actually move the conversation forward it's because if we support the superheroes at the front line with really good software and um, they can actually design the business models that can create a sustainable environment. Thanks Lisi. I want to move now the conversation and the topic to the long-term impacts of COVID-19 on financial inclusion and ask all of you uh, to share your views uh, Leslie, you, you can, you know, you started, perhaps I will leave you to continue uh, about, you know, perhaps, you know, sharing about the situation that you see with your work that you do, perhaps talking about the the, the, the government support, to, what are the government support to speed up, you know, all this development? So I can really echo what Bob said in his keynote. COVID-19 has brought an imperative to act. Government and donor agencies this summer have been talking about the need to accelerate our digital, um, our, our sustainable development goals. 2030 is too late. Uh, we have to move faster. And the conversation has really changed globally through COVID-19. Um, it was clear how markets with robust digital payments infrastructure could mobilise support in a, in a more efficient way. Um, and therefore, the conversation around digital public goods has, has been accelerated as part of that. But we've also seen in, in the last mile public and private collaboration in a speeded up. Well, in Kenya, M-Pesa reduced the fees for payments, and this has accelerated the growth of digital usage massively. Um, but we've also heard a lot about the missing middle. 
those who aren't employed or part of hunger safety net programs, gig workers, um, their income has dropped through the floor as the work has stopped. And there has been an increase there for almost in the digital divide over the last few months. When you used to earn $80 a month and now you earn 16 because the work has dried up, you stop buying data for your phone, you stop charging it, and you think hard about what bills are important to pay. And as well in this story, agents have proved themselves to be vital because they are actually in the last mile already. So, for example, we've got a UNCDF-led project in Myanmar, which is helping MFIs interact with mobile money agents to get loan repayments facilitated by digital rails. So I think it's really changed the dynamic of the conversation um, and the spirit of collaboration and co-opetition seems to be strong. Thanks. Run it. Uh, moving it to you, um, what's, what's your view? I mean, according to the 2020 Global COVID-19 FinTech Regulatory Rapid Assessment Study, regulators in emerging markets and developing economies are more likely to have reported increases in the usage of digital payments and digital banks. On the other hand, respondents see rising risk in the FinTech market concerning cybersecurity, operational risk, consumer protection, and fraud and scams. Rani, do you see any connections in between the two trends? And are there any special programs around to protect the most vulnerable from cybercrime? Sure. I, I think the first part of your question is easier to deal with. Uh, the connection is a bit harder. Um, so in the first part of the question, the reason that emerging market regulators, policymakers, companies will have seen a bigger impact during COVID is simply there are bigger problems to solve. Um, oftentimes I get asked a broader question, which is why have China or Kenya or Southeast Asia or India seen so much more quote-unquote innovation in, in fintech? And the answer is always the problems are so much bigger. Uh, Manisha threw out a number of 30% banked in Vietnam. Um, in the UK or the US, yes, there's a 5-10% missing, and that's important, but it's not 70%. Or That would have been similar in India pre-Aadhaar and pre the sort of um, you know, light banking accounts that have come in. So it's just the size of the problem. Now, during, during COVID, we've seen this in the Middle East as well, what you've seen is it's not just the base of the pyramid. Oftentimes, like next door, I mean, I'm in the UAE, but next door in Saudi Arabia, middle economy was very cash-based. Cards were used to take money out of ATMs. Now, what happened during COVID is that the government said, no, you've got to accept electronic payments. And so signs went up everywhere saying it was either encouraged or in some cases mandatory uh, to pay with the, with the card. So a lot of people have cards in the middle of the economy, just wouldn't use it. Uh, at the base of the economy, what you've seen, and it was this is before COVID, but COVID's accelerated it, whether it's wallet usage, um, um, sort of ele electronic or digital solutions, those 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 have really grown fast. I mean, we I was talking to a couple of fintech founders in um, in Lagos, Nigeria, uh, just last week, and they were talking about every month they saw month and month growth and year-in-year -year growth, but every month they saw, maybe one month, like when the, when the when lockdown first hit, they went down. But apart from that, every month they saw an increase. Um, so it's, you know, whether it's in Saudi Arabia, whether it's in Nigeria, you're seeing a, COVID, COVID is a massive accelerator. COVID's done more than any CTO could have done or any policymaker could have done to push digitization. Manisha, uh, your, view, your view on the long-term impact of COVID, you know, 19, what have you learned from the situation? Sure. You know, I, I echo what, what, what Ronit says, you know, COVID is, is, it has been a game changer for, for electronic payments. You know, our experience in Vietnam is, is a little bit different. Vietnam, the government, they acted very early, so we were very fortunate. We had we had a couple of lockdowns, but but not many cases. Life is pretty normal here. And so you didn't see the kind of force to, to electronic digital payments that you saw, for example, in the Philippines, or as Ronit was saying, in, in Saudi Arabia. What we saw, we saw two things, which, which we think are even more important than 
a quick increase in peer-to-peer -peer payments. We saw a, a huge mindset shift, you know, and, and I'm not talking about just from the users or our users. Our users change too. But the, the change from, you know, some of the largest government on supermarkets, the large offline players to switch to online, the urgency for them to realize that if there was a long-term lockdown, they didn't actually have a way to sell products. They didn't have a way to reach their users. That, that was huge. So I think that that, you know, made us you know, start to build use cases for supermarkets, for offline to online, things that we, we hadn't anticipated doing before the next three to four years. So all of that was accelerated. Our users, of course, increased their propensity to pay, which, which is kind of expected and accelerated. We also saw that the government pushed through a few big things. One of the big regulations that they passed was what is called EKYC, which means that we can work with a bank and somebody can get EKYC on the phone. That will enable banks, so the retail branch penetration in Vietnam is, is much is lower than it is in India or China. So there is a challenge that how do you reach the, 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 the people who want to have bank accounts? It's very expensive to go to tier two, three, four cities or small villages to reach the customer. It's not very expensive when you do it on the phone. So, so we think the combination of EKYC, the mindset shift, will all accelerate the, the move to, to mobile. And you see a little bit the trajectory, the number of transactions now, but I think the impact in three years will be, will be game changing. Thanks. And Nico, and I have this question now, what are the major trends the central bank has discovered due to the, the, the lockdown in people using digital financial services? And my question would be, uh, were there any improvement in Hungary in the take-up of the digital financial services? Are there any central bank initiatives to support and possibly maintain these positive developments? So actually, the pandemic has changed the, the people's attitude towards cashless payments also in Hungary. So uh, more than one-fifth of the population has been using uh, electronic payments more often in this period, and we do hope that uh, this uh, trend will continue. Uh, on top of that, the openness to digital banking has also increased significantly. So in 2018, only 45% of the bank customers were open for uh, managing their finances via either mobile phone or via net bank. And this number has surpassed 80% um, in the middle of uh, this year. That uh, means that uh, people are getting used to these digital channels and, and uh, have trust in all these. But um, still there are other opportunities for the service providers to offer fully digital financial products and services, as for example, the account opening and personal loan market is uh, the most advanced in terms of uh, digital banking and uh, only 60% of the market, uh, market supply is accessible via digital channels. Uh, in terms of central bank initiatives, I would uh, uh, highlight the introduction of the instant payment system, which went live uh, in a quite a, a timely period uh, at the beginning of March. And since uh, this was uh, the only system that obliged all the banks to participate. Actually, it was a game changer in Hungary, and we do hope that uh, the payment market and also the economy's competitiveness will increase in the medium run significantly due to these possibilities. So uh, based on this uh, network, uh, the money can move from account to account in uh, seconds, actually uh, in, on average in two seconds uh, on a 24-7 uh, availability. This means that uh, customers have the choice to 
rely on electronic payments in more and more real life situation and this can increase the access to electronic payments not only to the customers but family businesses and SMEs as well. And also in the upcoming uh, weeks, the central bank itself will introduce a chatbot function to improve uh, the uh, customer protection function. So the chatbot relying on artificial intelligence will be able to talk to the customers to increase their financial knowledge, uh, the awareness of the risk and uh, the special characteristics of the financial products. And uh, we do hope that we will be able to come up to, with, uh, with other new uh, technical and uh, financial innovative uh, projects uh, soon as well. Thanks, Aniko. Uh, I think, you know, the topic is, is, is it's very big and I know that, you know, we are quite, we, as a closing, as a closing, I just want to say that COVID-19 brought us several changes in digital financial services. And I would love to get, you know, all of you, I know that the central bank is doing quite a lot and it's, it, 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 it shows that it will last. It shows, you know, that we ha you have, you know, established and we hope that it will, you know, last for the, you know, the, the good stone for have a sustainability in this. Can I ask you, all of you, in one minute, to tell us, do you think these changes, especially the benefits, will be long-lasting? Furthermore, how do you see financial inclusion in the five, ten-year perspective? What are the main challenges we have to overcome to improve it? In one minute, what would be your closing for all of you? So perhaps I will share, I will start with Ronit. Leslie, Manisha, and Aniko, you know, you, you've you mentioned all of the great uh, initiatives by the central bank. Ronit. Uh, we can't hear you. In closing, Uma, I'll make two comments, one quantitative and one qualitative. On the quantitative side, already said earlier, we thought that the amount of unbanked population would go down to a billion, roll that forward, you're going to be looking at a few hundred million. So the quantitative problem in five or ten years will have been solved. The qualitative problem is still work in progress, and that's about taking the full range of financial services to the population. And that's going to be the really interesting development that we're going to be watching. Thanks, Renee. Leslie. Two things as well. 50% um, of the world's population are offline. And just like Bob said, when they come online, it doesn't mean that they're smartphone literate. So we've got to remember the digital divide in our conversations and that cash is king for a lot of people. And the second one. <laughs> Leslie, I'll have to, I'll have to right, right. the floor. Can you share with us the, your closing? It's the second one. Manisha, Manisha, Manisha. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, I, I have to echo. Uh, you know, I, I think COVID has been a game changer. So I think that in the next 10 years, you will see a disproportionate amount of people moving offline. I believe cash is king today. I believe in five to 10 years, it will not be king in most economies, including emerging markets, because of the advent of the mobile phone. It will democratize payments. I think the onus is on a combination of the service providers and the regulators to make sure that this is done in, an, in a way that is fair to, to all parties in the ecosystem, particularly the the less educated user. I think that, that if you can do that safely and securely to, to the last mile user, the one that is, is less educated or has less money, that is when the financial inclusion finally succeeds. Thank you very much, Aniko. Thank you, Manisha, Leslie, uh, Ranit, for you know, this very interesting uh, panel discussion. Uh, thank you very much for listening. It's an important topic. Looking forward to seeing more interesting development in financial inclusion. And uh, I wish you a great uh, continuation of the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Taman, and all the members of the panel for this truly wide-reaching discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll now be having a short break uh, when we hear from our partners, but we'll be back in a few minutes with our next session, Green and Sustainable Finance. See you then.
Geopolitics, History, Economics. The book titled American Empire vs. European Dream by Gerd Matolci, the governor of the Central Bank of Hungary, has been released. Providing a broad perspective, it analyzes the process of how the American Empire became the world's number one superpower, what motivations other major players in geopolitics had, how the European Union attempted to compensate the hegemon status of the American Empire, and how the European dream shattered at the dawn of a new world order. You can find the answers to these questions, as well as many important and topical issues, in Gerd Matolci's new book, which has already achieved international success. The book is available in bookstores or online, in the web shop of Paulos Atene Publishing House, or on Amazon.com.
Ladies and gentlemen, the World Fintech Festival in Budapest continues now with our next session on green and sustainable finance. First of all, I'd like to call upon the senior partner of the Vancouver office of McKinsey, Mr. Miklos Dietz, to deliver his keynote speech titled, Doing Good, How to Increase the Positive Environmental and Social Impact of the Financial Sector. As the title suggests, the financial sector has an elemental role in determining what our future will actually look like. Miklos is the senior partner of McKinsey's Vancouver office, as I mentioned, and since uh, joining the firm in 2001, he has specialized in strategy, business building, and innovation topics. And he has led over 400 projects in more than 40 countries. He is also the leader of the Cross-Industrial Global Ecosystems Group and the Global Banking Strategy and Innovation Group. Miklos joins us live from Vancouver, where I believe it's just after four o'clock in the morning. So, uh, Miklos, we're especially grateful that you've taken this time to be with us. Thank you, and please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Indeed, it's fresh early morning here, and I'm full of energy, so really happy to share uh, my thoughts on this topic, especially because from a strategic perspective, we believe that the environmental and social impact of banking is a very strategic one. It goes actually beyond just ESG, and this is why uh, we are trying to look at the broader implications, what we call doing good here. Let me go to the first page, please, and uh, to kind of summarize a little bit what I wanted to briefly touch in the next few minutes. So if we go to the next page, uh, we, I wanted to speak about uh, four topics. I don't know if I don't know if the page is moving. <laughs> uh, I wanted to speak about four topics. Number one, uh, what is actually the historical implications and role of uh, banking, and and uh, how. Uh, and how this has evolved over history. It's actually an un unusually important topic to look at the historical implications. Then I wanted to touch a little bit, why we, do we believe that this is not just a general corporate social responsibility topic, but why it can actually create also shareholder value, value. why for fintechs and for banks, this is one of those topics when one can actually have the rare win-wins in uh, business world. And I was hope. Uh, and uh, could, could we move the next page, please? Uh, then I was hoping to touch a little bit the a little bit the topic on topic on how uh, what is the end game here? Where, where how do we see a potential bank of the future being truly integrated? in terms of social and environmental impact by being also quite successful. And then finally, I wanted to touch a couple of practical implications. I'm, I'm wondering if we can move to the next page here. Sorry, I, I, I don't see, I don't see if, the, if, the, if the page is moving. Hello? Hello, can we, can we move the next page, please? Okay. Hello? Okay, wonderful, okay. So let's, let's, let's go back a little bit, please. <laughs> let's go back a little bit. And uh, so let me start with the history here. The history is, uh, if you look at, if you look at back to the 15th, 16th, 17th century, the early history of banking in Europe and also belong, beyond, it had a tremendous positive implication. I was actually planning to go to the previous page. Uh, it had a tremendous positive implications. Banking, after all, solve the big problem of how to shift money from those who have it to those who need it, how to finance projects, and how to 
open up the economy from the less than 1% of truly rich to the rest of the population. It created social mobility, which then created the whole revolution of developing the middle class, which in turn created uh, a totally new political systems. It created the rule-based global economy. Banking has been the lighthouse of economic development, of uh, growth, and of social stability for hundreds of years. Countries who had growing banking sectors became uh, global leaders, not just economically, but truly global leaders in terms of enabling larger and larger parts of the population to benefit from economic growth and also leading to accelerated growth from at the very beginning from the Netherlands in Europe to then uh, the Great, Great Britain and then the rest of the world. That type of amazing positive growth though and that type of huge positive impact is not something we have seen and recognized in the second half of the 21st century. If, in fact, if we look back, if we, if we look back more to the financial crisis, what we see is uh, banks rather being the problem almost, and uh, having a reputation of uh, moving risks, making a lot of money, being bailed out by uh, by uh, the global economy and uh, by other sectors while uh, causing potentially negative impact. Now, that the global financial crisis was almost the pinnacle of bad banks. And uh, you may recognize many of the headlines from 2008, including how uh, bailed out banks CEOs were ignoring the negative impact they are causing. This crisis is very different though. First and foremost, it was not started by banks, but also very importantly, in, 20, in 2020, in the global COVID crisis, banking has shown the positive impact it can have on the economy. It has shown how it can help protecting uh, peoples and businesses from the negative effect. And banks were able to successfully collaborate with many governments who were quick in intervention and helped actually uh, not just shield, but also hopefully will help to rec uh, the economy to recover in the coming year. So that's a very different crisis. And that's also a timely reminder of how banking can really make a difference. In fact, if we could go to the next page, uh, it's important to recognize that banking is has a disproportionate role in terms of uh, global uh, social and environmental impact. Not just because banking is big. I mean, banking is around 5% of the global total revenue force. It's around seven, it's a seven and a half trillion dollar business, but that's not its primary reason why it has such a disproportionate role in driving sustainable and socially impactful uh, stable economy. But this, if you go to the other side of the chart, so if we can click one more, it is the fact that uh, the banking system also drives around another 200, uh, close to $300 trillion of capital, which is going through. It may be only 5% of the economy, but it actually intermediates another 90% of capital globally, which means that it, if the banking system can install meaningful environmental and social uh, rules, it will basically affect the rest of the economy. So with great power comes great responsibility. And banking here should be able to uh, effectively drive a transformation to a better economy in the future. Now, I would argue banks should follow that. And if you can go, go to the next page, please. Uh, banks should do that not just because not just because because they are good but also because it is actually a profitable thing to do there is a win-win scenario here and if you could go to the next page i'm happy to speak a little bit more about that there is a meaningful scenario for fintechs and for banks and for financial institutions in, in general to do good for the world 
and also benefit from it. Banks can enable uh, its customers, even, even gently nudge and even force its customers to create positive social and, engineer, uh, and environmental impact. It can actually set rules and drive economic growth as it has been doing hundreds of years ago at its beginnings. Banking can act as a positive agent for social mobility. After all, the very concept of financial intermediation creates mobility, moving money from older generations to younger in the form of, let's say, mortgage sector or you know, capital investments into projects. Banks can be very helpful in helping, especially the segments who need the most help. It's like the classical thing that people who are typically most vulnerable Segments who have been most hit by crisis, economic segments, they are the ones who need money most. And the very own banking system can actually create value from them. Uh, it can also drive environmental impact of, uh, and transformation of other industries. If financial markets and capital are setting rules for uh, environmental sustainability, uh, guess what? Companies do follow. And banks can also really help supporting local communities. They need to be very integrated into them and they can truly make a difference. But at the same time, this is also good for financial institutions, fintechs and banks, because it enables, first and foremost, doing good can differentiate them, which is very important. We are entering an extremely competitive decade in terms of banking with razor thin margins, very low interest rates and extremely strong competition from big techs, we are looking at times when banks are facing disintermediation and commoditization, uh, and for them, differentiation will become extremely important. And what is more differentiating and have true positive social and environmental impact? Interestingly, though, uh, getting more meaningful uh, social connectivity and therefore creating stronger ties with customers who care about this can also reduce risk cost, decrease churn, enable lower acquisition costs for customers, and overall create shareholder values. So we believe that there is actually a rare win-win in global economy of a positive impact on uh, both the economy and uh, shareholders of banks and, 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 and their customers. It's, like a, it's truly a triple win. So if you go to the next page, uh, the next page, please. I, 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 we, would, we have been doing some surveys and research recently, and we have been looking at not just asking people, because that's always overestimates the impact, but looking from revealed choices and different ways of how important uh, social and environmental impact of banking for its customers. And what we have found is already, now, around 10 to 15 percent of growth of uh, retail revenue pools are influenced by purpose, i.e., there are or, there is already around 300 billion dollars of revenue pool, which is coming from serving clients who are willing to choose banks based partially on their environmental and social impact, who are willing to sacrifice some margins or some income or some features if they feel that they are serving the right institutions. That's already a $300 billion opportunity. But if we go to the next page, I, we, we are arguing that because of demographics, this is actually likely to, to grow. It's very heavily driven by basically Gen Y and millennial behavior, but it's also start to spread to Gen X, which is actually a much bigger <laughs> economic revenue pool. If, if we are just looking at the trend of these numbers, we could argue that is likely to go much faster than global overall revenue pools, and we could see uh, 300 billion to double or triple in the next five years. And we have also see banks waking up to this, whether we are looking at social bonds, social impact credit cards, whether we are looking at uh, solutions and uh, products who are measuring uh, environmental and social impact of financial institutions, impact investing, obviously, is an enormous topic. Uh, we have seen how we have seen how that one is spreading. So, if we go to the next page, uh, let's first look at the 
Uh, then let's also specifically look at the environmental part of it. This is a this is one of the most visible examples of how finance can drastically change. In a world when we got used to a like five percent economic growth, sustainable investment assets are growing by fifteen, and now seems to be accelerating and growing even faster, close to nineteen percent per annum, uh, driving essentially already. Uh, more than a third of all global financial assets. This is $61 trillion is forecasted to be in this category by uh, 2022, which means that essentially uh, financial institutions, again, who get models right, whether they are green deposits, whether they are solutions, they can, they can achieve this proportion growth. But that $61 trillion is just just sustainable investment asset, but there are far more opportunities on the horizon than just having those funds being environmentally conscious. Uh, green deposits, for example, is an idea when, uh, in, when investors' deposits can actually be ring-fenced and uh, ensure that they are provided to environmentally friendly projects. Digital impact accounts can track and measure uh, the, the positive or negative carbon effect of Carbon neutral incentives can drive uh, businesses accordingly. There is far more on the horizon than just uh, green investment, and it can and it should drive innovation at a very rapid speed simply because of the economic opportunity here. If we go to the next page, I would, uh, I would argue uh, that in this front, of course, as in almost every front of banking, fintechs are at the very forefront of transformation. I've shown some banking examples in the previous pages, but there is an almost, an, 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 an almost impossible to fully track how many new ideas are uh, coming up all over the world on these topics from ethical investment and enabling ethical investments to creating responsible earned wage to enable employee involvement to create new type of green energy marketplace and carbon marketplaces, financial institutions, fund managers, specialized fintechs, they are coming up and driving innovation at the, uh, at the very forefront of the banking everywhere, and they are getting this proportional positive impact out, out of it. So where does this all lead? If we could go to the next page. Uh, we believe that the end game is that many, many financial institutions of, of size from large incumbent banks to very small specialists will be able to create truly differentiated relationship with their customers from uh, driving their behavior every day, from helping customers to invest those customers who care about this, obviously, people have a choice and will have a choice, but customers who care will be able to use their financial institutions, not just for investing into environmentally and socially impactful laws, but most likely uh, the sector will work out tracking systems and scoring systems, which will enable people to choose the right companies they are working with uh, to track their environmental and social impact. They will likely to be able to reward it uh, for the positive impact they are generating. It can create and enable also small businesses. The financial sector can enable them to be environmentally and socially con con uh, conscious, connect them with the customers. So they can actually, it can actually enable banking to go beyond banking and become an orchestrator of the broader environmental and social ecosystem, which would be a two game changer for the sector. So to close this all, if we could go to the next page, What does this mean uh, for financial institution? Well, we believe there are some do's and there are some don'ts. First and foremost, this is a major topic. Do not treat this only as corporate social responsibility. Corporate social responsibility is important, but this is a broader topic. It needs to be embedded in strategy. It needs to embed it from the very purpose of the organization to strategy, to operations, to everything. Collections, by the way, very important uh, topic which needs to be connected. Don't wait for regulators. 
to set uh, up the rules. The banking system can and should be a driver, set up its own goal. From triple balance sheets to ethical codex, it should act as a leader rather than a follower. Do not be over-focused on philanthropy. Enable customers to uh, make these choices. Banks should not be nice by themselves. They should enable their customers to be nice and do the good things. And it has to happen daily, not yearly once. Every touch point with the customer needs to enable to positive uh, choices and uh, for the environment and for social impact. And don't just focus on sales. Look at every element of the banking system to be able to create and maintain positive impact. Doing this right can be one of the biggest differentiators in an extremely competitive and challenging next decade we are looking at. And this closes a little bit my intro. Hopefully it was useful. Now we can, Thank we you. Can, we can start. Miklos, I, if you're done. Um, we thank you very much for that uh, very detailed and highly uh, informative speech. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now continue the uh, conference with a panel discussion on the management of climate and environmental risks. Allow me to refer to the widely, widely shared consensus that large sums of both public and private funds will be required to address the sustainability challenge. This need presents a huge opportunity for financiers and intermediaries that advise on these deals and, of course, developers too. In the second section of this event, we will search for opportunities surrounding green and sustainable finance. The moderator of this section will be a Singapore FinTech Festival ambassador and the other co-founder of CFTE, the Centre for Finance, Technology and Entrepreneurship, Mr. Hugh Yuan Trio. Now, apart from these roles, he is also the CEO of the Disruptive Group, a business builder and advisory firm in innovation and finance. He is a fintech fellow at the Centre for Global Finance and Technology at Imperial College and an entrepreneurship expert at Oxford said Entrepreneurship Centre. He is also a member of ESMA's Consultative Working Group for Financial Innovation and a founding member of the Asian Supercharger, one of the largest fintech accelerators in Asia. Hugh, I now hand over to you uh, so you can introduce the topic and the members of your panel. Thank you very much and uh, welcome everyone. Thanks a lot for joining this panel. Uh, I'm uh, really glad that we're having this discussion. It's part of the Impact Summit of the Singapore FinTech Festival. And uh, we've heard some very, very interesting discussions over the last few hours. Uh, there was a panel on financial inclusion. You know, that's definitely one of the part of impact. And you know, for this panel now, we will talk about another topic, which is climate and environmental risk. So that's the purpose of this topic. And I think what is interesting about this topic, and we've just heard you know, from the previous presentation, uh, in terms of you know, it's good for the banks, uh, it's good for uh, society in general, but I think that in the current environment, there are some questions that we have to ask ourselves. And the question is, you know, we can't really stop all our existing activities and just to focus on climate and environmental risk. At the same time, we're, we're having a huge pandemic and a health crisis. We're also entering into the worst, perhaps, recession ever. So how do we manage all those climate risks and environmental risks on top of this? Uh, so you're currently watching the Budapest stage uh, of the Singapore FinTech Festival, and we'll have speakers from all around the world. So let me introduce you know, all the different speakers. Uh, and hopefully, you know, we can see them. I can't see, uh, hopefully, you can see on the screen. Uh, but uh, the first speaker would be Shaba Kandrash. Can you see him on the screen? Hopefully you can see him, but let me introduce him first. Uh, so from Budapest, we have Shaba Kandrash, who's deputy governor of the Central Bank of Hungary, MNB. And uh, Shaba is responsible for the supervisory activities of the Central Bank. 
For the topic of today, which is around green finance and sustainable finance, he's part of MNB's senior management for all the sustainable finance policy. And as part of his role of, uh, on the EU side, he is responsible uh, and he is a representative of MNB's participation in the, the EU sustainable banking policy making. Uh, next, we have coming from New York, we have Yuval, and Yuval Roos is a co-founder and CEO of Digital Asset. And Digital Asset is a blockchain firm established in 2015. Yuval helped to raise $150 million in funding from different strategic investors, and they work with a lot of different organizations like ASX or VMware, for example. Prior to Digital, uh, Asset, Digital Asset, he was uh, part of Citadel and DRW uh, uh, Trading. And uh, for this topic today, for sustainability, he's part of different forums, including the World Economic Forum or Interworld Alliance, for example. Now, let me jump to the other side of the world and to Korea and Seoul, where uh, I'm very happy to welcome Susan. So, Susan Peterson is the Assistant Director General of the Global Green Growth Institute, GGGI. She's also the head of investment policy solution at GGGI. And GGGI is responsible for providing technical support and services in green investment and policy for governments around the world. She's been in that space for a long time, working for the last 25 years, in basically trying to catalyze and helping catalyze partnerships and technology transfers in this field of environmental and climate change. And uh, not too far from you, Suzanne, uh, in Shanghai, we have Charles. Uh, so Charles is a deputy dean of academics and professor of finance at Kudan University. Uh, he worked uh, on a lot of different topics from fintech to investment, corporate finance, and behavioral finance. Uh, he's very, very widely quoted top journals. And on top of this, uh, he also helped to establish the FinTech Research Center in 2018 and has been its director since. So I'm very glad to have all those experts coming from all around the world. Uh, I have a lot of questions, but I also want to make this session very, very interactive. So on your screen, you can ask questions. I can see the questions that you ask. So please make sure that you ask questions. And as I told in our speakers, Let's try to make it you know, as you know, interactive and engaging for everyone as possible. Uh, so we will try not to have long monologues of five minutes, but much more a real dialogue between all of us. So first, uh, I would have a question for Shaba. And uh, Shaba, so I can see you now. Uh, great to Hi. see you. So first question for you. Uh, and you know, let's start with the foundation, because we'll talk about you know, responsible finance, sustainable finance. But for a lot of people, they don't really know what it is. So my first question is that MNB, you are an official endorser of the UN's principle for responsible banking. But what is responsible banking and what does it mean concretely for you at MNB? Thank you very much. And uh, it's a great honor to be here and uh, be part of this uh, panel. And yes, indeed, with the support of our Financial Stability Council, we became an official supporter of the principles for responsible banking early this year. And the principles uh, expect the signatory banks to align their business uh, models and the business uh, strategy uh, with, the, with the goal of the environmental, uh, with the goal of the sustainable development. Uh, to reduce their socially and uh, environmentally harmful impacts and to strengthen uh, positive effects. In line with that, uh, the, the signing banks need to do a deep analysis uh, of uh, their current impact on the environment and see where they can make uh, progress. And uh, as an official supporter, uh, the MMB, the Hungarian Central Bank, we encourage our uh, banks and the financial um, institution to, to sign these uh, principles and uh, make a, a very uh, com uh, deep and uh, powerful commitment, but a realistic uh, one. 
and therefore uh, to encourage them we also uh, integrate the principles into our new uh, outcoming uh, green recommendation and uh, and uh, therefore officially we try to push the banks uh, towards this uh, direction so we try to be uh, we try to use uh, as tool as we have and try to be very innovative. Thank you very much, uh, Shabas. I think it's a good way you know, to start in terms of setting the foundations. Uh, I would like to uh, ask a question to uh, Suzanne, because, of course, you know, we have you know, all those different you know, objectives. You know, we'd like you know, to, uh, I know for a bank, you know, I guess, you know, to make money, you know, for... You know, to do good you know, for the environment, uh, but how do we do it you know, uh, concretely? And especially you know, in this environment, which is a challenging environment from a health standpoint, economic standpoint, uh, how do we reconcile you know, those different you know, objectives? Well, that's uh, of course a big uh, question for everyone, but I think we're in one of those uh, once in a lifetime uh, moments where we can address the global challenges of climate change, environmental degradation and social inclusion, while also uh, addressing the economic crisis. Not to address these dimensions together would be a mistake. Uh, without bold actions, uh, consequences would be uh, devastating for our future uh, if we don't act on climate change. And uh, of course, the economy will be harmed eventually. We find in a way that the ongoing development of Green New Deal policies uh, in, for instance, the EU, China, the Republic of Korea are very promising and uh, offer opportunity for governments to link climate action to their development plans and COVID-19 recovery plans. You can even sort of uh, talk about a, a race to net zero at the moment. Uh, GGDI is an intergovernmental organization uh, uh, working with uh, 38 member states uh, and with presence in more than 40 countries. And our mission is to support country governments transition to a model of economic growth that is also environmentally sustainable and socially inclusive. So we do find uh, that it is possible to do both at the same time. But of course, there's need for robust uh, research to identify the most efficient pathways to deliver the Paris Agreement goals and climate neutrality. So as such, we are uh, working uh, to support countries in uh, planning their climate transition using a robust economic-wide modeling and systems approaches. And for instance, right now in Hungary, we are uh, completing a study for the Hungarian government that informed the planning uh, efforts towards carbon neutrality by 2050. The results are actually showing that the climate transition is also leading to an increased GDP, to green jobs creation, and a number of co-benefits such as improved air quality and restored biodiversity. And actually, McKinsey has just come out in 2020 with a new report that are also reaching similar conclusions uh, for Europe, especially that uh, Europe can reach uh, net zero emissions at net zero cost. So I think that's uh, really interesting. And of course, green recovery uh, in this trying uh, time is an important area of action for GGGI. So we are also working to uh, help with uh, the governments that we work for in greening their uh, recovery packages. And um, we have also uh, published our own uh, report this year that contained uh, recommendations for governments to design their recovery packages and deliver climate action as well. Uh, it's called Achieving Green Growth and Climate Action Post-COVID-19. Uh, I could get into many, many examples of what we're doing, but in the interest of time, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Suzanne. So you're saying that uh, green actually could uh, be a factor of growth. So it doesn't have you know, 
to be you know, two different things. Uh, but so how do we do it? Uh, and perhaps, you know, uh, of course, you know, we're, we're part of the Singapore FinTech Festival. So we'll talk a lot about you know, FinTech and innovations. Uh, and perhaps, uh, you know, Charles, you know, what do you think? You know, what kind of you know, uh, uh, innovation you know, can help you know, this uh, green recovery? Yeah, I, I'm going to probably step all over you, Val, to answer as well. I'm such a big fan of what digital asset does. But I actually really think that asset digitization and tokenization is actually a, a core, core part to it. You know, so much of finance is about connecting value um, with investment and matching risk and reward and so forth. And traditionally, when we look at the big um, infrastructure deals, when we look at hydropower, um, you're talking about five, 10 years of capital expenditure before you start to even begin to sniff what would be called a financial return. And, and that's why the big financial investors are no longer interested in these kind of projects. Um, and, and in a lot of the emerging economies, you know, that's why it's so hard to think sustainability um, and green tech, um, you know, for lack of that sort of kickstart um, to get us moving. Um, but if we move to a world where tokenization and blockchain are now enabling ecosystem finance, where we're moving away from a mega, uh, be it global bank or investment bank, or even a world bank IMF, where we're moving away from them cutting a hundred million dollar check and being able to look to our ecosystems and say, you know, who's going to capture the value of this green tech. When I build a hydro plant, who's going to benefit from that clean energy? And can we get the local ecosystems to be part of that fundraise? And suddenly we see people who have long-term views of value creation within the economy are now engaged in that investment practice and we're less reliant or potentially not reliant at all on you know, the, the pure financial investors, which may have, um, and rightfully so, some responsibilities to their investors and to their shareholders for short-term return, um, but that sometimes you know, don't, don't, aren't able to sort of dovetail with the needs of, of green and sustainable development. And then we we'll go further beyond that, and we think about how do we enable ultra-small businesses? How do we do microfinancing in emerging economies? And, and interestingly, the solution is still the same. If we're able to, to leverage fintech and things like blockchain to generate tra super transparent transactions and able to share in a meaningful way what those are actual value uh, chain look like, where is the business coming in and out, and we're able to verify that, now all of a sudden these small and even micro businesses that look very risky uh, from an investment perspective, all of a sudden... You know, I have that comfort level to say, oh, well, I can see what's going on. I can see their invoices and, and so forth and their accounts receivable going forward. And suddenly that opaqueness that's characteristic of so many emerging markets um, it is gone, right? And, and suddenly the honest business person has access to capital markets they never saw before. And the dishonest person, of course, is removed from the economy. And, and, and you, know, you have to argue that that's good for everybody. So... Um, you know, I think, you know, leveraging these technologies to bring into the concept of ecosystem financing um, and the transparency and the risk reduction that these technologies provide, I think that's a great first step. And I think we're ready to make that step pretty soon. So what do you think, Yuval? So I guess, Noah, you share the same view on blockchain? Uh, so I can't hear you. I don't know if no others no can hear you, but I can't hear you. Hello. Can you hear me? Perfect. Sorry about that. Um, so first of all, thank you, Charles, for that tea up. It was actually really good. So I, I think that first of all, when we think about when we think about uh, sustainable finance, that the idea is, can we actually create value? while thinking about sustainability without destruction. And I think that before we even get into some of the things that we can do going forward, I think it's actually important to note there have been plenty of studies that compare the, the financial return of companies that are thinking about social good or about sustainability. And it's already been proven that they outperform their peers. 
Um, so already, already from a brand perspective, companies that are thinking about sustainability should be aware that from a brand and customer perspective are going to have uh, better returns. That, that's already been shown. So that's, for me, already a good sign uh, for the future. Second of all, I think that if you think about what Suzanne said, we have a financial crisis and I think it's a great opportunity, no different than like in the, in the Great Depression, it was a great opportunity to create infrastructure in order to stimulate the economy. I think that there's a great opportunity here to stimulate the economy while thinking about sustainability, thinking about how do we use this opportunity to create a more sustainable future. So that's just generally speaking some things that, that I think we should think about. But at the end of the day, I think in order to create a more sustainable future, it can come from different places. So I think governments can take a very active role uh, in terms of regulation, but I would actually uh, call for more positive regulation rather than you must do this, which usually gets circumvented a lot of times, right? People find loopholes, how to how to break rules or or achieve the rules, not in the original intention, but actually think about positive reinforcement type of regulation. If you have done something that can be proven that was good for the economy or was good for the environment, there will be a positive economic return for you as a company. And I think that generally speaking, we find those uh, historically um, um, more motivating and actually more successful at creating a positive impact. So that's, I think, how governments can be uh, extremely helpful. And we're seeing a lot of government initiatives that are trying to do exactly that. But I think on the private sector, to Charles' point, I do think that if you think about sustainability, it's not an individual task. It's not an individual corporation task, right? At the end of the day, if you're starting to look at the trend of net neutrality by a lot of the big uh, players, Amazon, Microsoft, all of these players that are calling to be net neutral, their footprint, their impact is, is not just Microsoft itself or, or any of those companies. It's their entire supply chain. It's their customer base. It's, it's so many big interactions. And in order to create these networks that can actually create sustainable finance, you want to think about data sharing, right? And, and real-time data sharing. And that's why I agree with Charles that the idea of using blockchain and tokenization is a really good way to start achieving that. Now, to me, tokenization is synonymous with standardization, right? Because to have an asset, to tokenize an asset, you have to agree on that asset. And one of the biggest issues I see today in sustainable finance is lack of on standards or some kind of agreement. How do we how do we actually offset uh, carbon? Uh, what are the type of assets that we can offset? How do you offset that? That's one aspect, standardization. But the other part, and Charles started touching on it, real-time data, there's a lot of fraud that exists in, for example, in carbon markets. So we believe that the usage of blockchain technology and tokenization can really accelerate uh, the, the initiatives around what we would call verifiable carbon offsets, right? So you could actually validate that if you are purchasing a carbon offsetting product, that same product wasn't sold to you know, 20 other customers that all think they offset their uh, carbon footprint by a certain amount, but actually realize that uh, the same product was sold to too many. And that still exists today. And I think that using um, uh, blockchain technology and smart contracts, you could really drive a much better uh, infrastructure for net neutrality. No, thanks a lot. And, and uh, I guess you know, between the two of you, that's really interesting in terms of you know, what you mentioned in terms of you know, the need for transparency and you know, data sharing. Uh, and you know, here we talk about, you know, uh, I guess, you know, very new innovations. Uh, wanted to go back to perhaps you know, something which is you know, less you know, on, on that stage of you know, blockchain, but you know, green bonds, because we hear a lot about green bonds. Uh, and wanted to hear you know, Suzanne's views on that, you know, which is you know, what are green bonds you know, today? You know, what's the impact? Uh, is there really an impact or not? And you know, what are the next steps for green bonds? Um, thank you very much. Uh, obviously, uh, let's say, uh, Green bonds has been around for uh, at least uh, some time, but uh, compared to the uh, normal uh, market, uh, you could say uh, it's it's still net. Uh, it's very small. It's only about maybe one trillion US dollars in 2020 
compared to the global bond market size of, you know, more than 128 <laughs> trillion. So it, it's definitely uh, small. And uh, we, uh, as a institution have uh, certainly started working on this, but uh, many of our uh, developing countries, emerging uh, economy uh, governments, uh, it's still pretty new to them. So we are more sort of working on uh, lifting the barriers in various ways, you know, de developing policy guidelines, regulatory frameworks, pilots and green bonds, uh, issuance, etc., enhancing the, the enabling environment and, and so forth. There are definitely uh, many other countries, uh, certainly in Europe and elsewhere, that have uh, great experience in, in this area. But we, we see it just being an emerging sort of area for, for our work. So uh, uh, it could be very interesting. It's certainly one of the ways to, uh, let's say, catalyze uh, access to climate finance and green investments. But, you know, we also looking at more sort of traditional, um, let's say, uh, uh, methodologies, you know, developing national financing vehicles that are capable of blending international and domestic capital. We, we have quite some experience with um, national financing vehicle design and oper operationalization in Colombia, Ethiopia, Mongolia, Rwanda, Senegal, etc., and also just uh, basically uh, uh, developing, uh, you know, um, green bankable projects that attract uh, in both public-private investments uh, in sectors such as renewable energy, waste to resources, etc. But uh, we are experimenting certainly with the green bonds and uh, uh, hopefully we will uh, be able to show many more results later on. Thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. Uh, anybody has any other views on on green bonds? Uh, so I think you do have a view, Yuval, but we can't hear you. Yep. I think I think that uh, sorry about that. I think that um, that green bonds is a very important initiative, but but to my taste, they're not green enough. Um, uh, to me, they're 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 just bonds uh, that have have a, a you know a shade of green to them. And 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 really and really, um, if if we want to really think about green bonds as as a way to raise capital for a sustainable future, uh, what I would like to see is more and more bonds <coughs> having restrictive covenants that are actually measuring the impact of that bond, um, because at the end of the day, and and that the return on the bond is adjusted uh, to the outcome of the bond. So let's just take a very easy example. If you're if you're um, uh, if you are trying to raise money to build uh, uh, you know some kind of power plant a windmill for example, um, you know there's the time to market. How fast am I going to start producing that green energy? Are you on time? Did you actually deliver it? Uh, how much energy are you going to provide? How much are you going to give back into the grid? All kinds of things that are part of your project. That's what you're selling to your investors, and to actually hold hold the, the borrower to some covenants uh, that are um, tracking the, the, the plan, the project. I would like to see those kind of things in green bonds. And, and that's where it goes back to Charles' point around technology, right? You can't start doing those kind of things without inclusion of technology. So how do you connect, for example, um, uh, IoT devices into these projects that feed back into a very, uh, very uh, transparent uh, system that can actually prove to your lenders that you are actually performing according to the project and we don't need to run an audit on whoever's borrowing the money. So really streamline these kind of infrastructure plays, I think will give uh, a massive push to, in my opinion, a very good idea that, that really haven't even reached its, uh, its, uh, you know, its potential, not even close. Well, uh, thanks, I'll just jump in if I may. Um, yeah, you know, ahead, and you all, I mean, that, that, that all comes to that third party validation once again, right? And, and that, that now comes into, you know, uh, I think back to the really primitive forms of, of uh, public governance, things like Amber Alert in the United States, right? Whereby 
you know, a handful of police officers, how can they track the whole of the state? But millions of smartphone users, all with video and phone capabilities and, ca and camera capabilities, can do all sorts of outreach and all sorts of monitoring that, you know, a, 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 you know, a regular law enforcement agency can never do. Um, but, but I also wanted to speak to your point on that positive, sort of less punitive view of the role of the regulator. You know, one of the things that, that we've been doing and one of the um, uh, projects that I've been working on has been with the Kingdom of Bhutan. Um, and, and I think maybe some people have heard of, you know, they have this sort of um, uh, happiness uh, uh, profile, right? This gl gross domestic happiness concept. Um, really, though, that, that, that's not just sitting around all day and, and smiling at home, right? That's a combination of a lot of things. That's a combination of rest hours, work hours, pension, personal health, um, of course, environmental impact and so forth. Um, and one of the things that we've been working with um, uh, with their government to do is to, on the one hand, look at sustainable energy, and of course, their geo, you know, their geographic position gives them all sorts of opportunities with hydro and and others, but also to work with that gross um, domestic happiness concept. And can we tokenize this in a meaningful way and actually make it into a virtual commodity? Um, that now, as you said, if you're doing good for sustainability, you're now receiving these tokens, which have a actual tradable value um, within the economy of Bhutan that might buy you carbon credit, that might buy you fuel, um, that might buy you tax releases, that might earn you um, agricultural subsidies, you know, all these sort of things that now can be connected together and not at all in a punitive way, but rather in sort of a reward mechanism. And, you know, they've been doing this happiness thing for some time. So they actually have their own accounting system for this already. And for us, all we really need to do to me is sort of a, you know, it's really a simple task of bringing the, um, you know, the IT infrastructure into place, the validation into place, um, and, and helping them to build out that token economy upon, again, a construct that they already believe in and that already exists and that we can enable in a very, very powerful way. So I just wanted to say I, I really enjoy that idea of having a positive feedback role rather than you know, being simply punitive. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Charles. So we went from green bonds you know, to the need you know, to have something you know, which is more than you know, what we have today to uh, how to tokenize happiness. Uh, and Shaba, what do you think about it? Do you have a view also on, on green bonds that can take us even further? Yeah, uh, I think it's a very interesting uh, discussion. And uh, uh, Juba mentioned that uh, the importance of the, the governments and uh, uh, next to the governments, uh, I, I think the, the central banks also could have uh, uh, some role to to facilitate uh, the, the the green finance and of course uh, uh, green bonds it's, it could be uh, part of that uh, uh, in terms of the central bank somehow uh, give guidance and 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 maybe a little bit more uh, to to help uh, to improve this uh, this green uh, bonds uh, market also and for instance here in uh, Hungary the the sustainable finance is yet uh, as Susan also mentioned, is just a small but 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 very growing uh, segment, and uh, and uh, this is this is uh, one way uh, where we can uh, uh, go, and uh, and I think uh, as a central bank uh, we could uh, facilitate this whole process, uh, and, and and let me talk about a little bit what uh, uh, what we are doing here as a central bank uh, in Hungary, because maybe could give you or, or anybody else uh, uh, a good example because, because we would like to uh, uh, really, really uh, broadcast uh, the, the green finance, the whole green issue towards the, uh, our uh, financial institutions. And to do that, uh, we, we decided that uh, we create a very, very uh, structured uh, approach. And that's why we created a a green strategy uh, to the central bank, and it has three pillars. 
the first pillar is that we we try to define what kind of tools we have. For instance, how we can uh, encourage uh, and and help to and promote the the green bonds uh, market. Uh, we try to define our uh, natural tools which, which what can uh, help uh, the institutions and and there is another one for instance the capital requirements what uh, what uh, uh, supervisory authority can uh, define the second pillar is that that we try to uh, find out partners uh, for instance uh, this uh, conference and and other partners ggi and and the uh, united nations and etc uh, to build a community uh, where we can discuss the different approaches uh, and and of course uh, from the market point of view from the central bank point of view the government point of view we can uh, understand each other in a in a better way and 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 and, and try to find out the the win-win solutions and the third pillar is not just uh, saying but but doing uh, something uh, that's why we we launched uh, a program uh, where we reduce our carbon emission and within the next two years we would like to reduce uh, our carbon emission by 30 percentage and and uh, the next uh, five years we would like to reduce uh, 80 percentage and we would like to become the first or maybe uh, somewhere in the first place uh, uh, as a central bank who works as a, a net zero emission uh, central bank so these are an, an, an overall picture, maybe a little bit more than just a green bond, but in my point of view, green bond is one part of this whole uh, complex uh, 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 platform, and, and we have to find out the good solution. This is my personal opinion. Oh, thanks a lot, Shabai. And that, uh, that was really clear. I think that was really good you know, to uh, separate that into the tools. And we talked about you know, different you know, tools which are available. I think there's a point that came back from a lot of you, which is the, the ecosystem uh, and the fact that everybody you know, has a role and uh, everybody you know, can have a leverage and an influence. Uh, and, uh, and the part about you know, doing it yourself. Uh, I like the part which I think you know, nobody mentioned until you mentioned it, which is no capital requirements. Uh, I used to be in a bank you know, before, and you know, there's a lot of talk that we can have. But once you discuss about capital requirements, then you know, that does no focus, not the effort. And uh, perhaps uh, I see that we're running out of time. So I'd like to ask a last question, which is you know, there's a lot of different players and actors you know, in that space. And so we can all do something around it. But uh, a, a theoretical question, if you could be anyone in any organization, anywhere in the world, who would you be and what would you do to have the most impact on sustainability? And perhaps, no, let me start with uh, Suzanne. Well, <laughs> it's, uh, I, I, I am actually pleased to be in a way where I am right now because, uh, you know, the mission of uh, the work that we do with the member governments is uh, really important and uh, certainly also in the green recovery uh, situation. So I, I think uh, for the time being, uh, I'm happy being part of uh, one of those organizations uh, working for, you know, the greater good, <laughs> maybe uh, not uh, only for profit, uh, not that I disrespect that in any way. I worked in the private sector for 20 years myself, but uh, it's also nice to be uh, in, in a do good type of organization. So I'm, I'm actually quite happy about that. <laughs> so I'm sure others have more exciting aspirations. Thank you. Yeah. No, thanks a lot, Susan. I just hope that not everybody will just say, I'm very happy to be where I am. So you, you Val, <laughs> what do you think? I will say that I'm very happy to be where I am, but but if I if I answer the question of, of where, where I would I choose, listen, at the end of the day, I think that the, the reality about this space is that by doing and actually leading by example, you could create a massive movement. So some of the things that Charles talked about, that Susan talked about, those are all great examples. And, and the more we have of those, uh, the more we have of those, uh, we will see positive impact. So if you ask me, choose one organization, it would have to look something like one of those mega companies, because I think their footprint 
touches so many of the aspects of sustainability. If you think about supply chain, energy, so take any big of the Google, the Amazon, the Alibaba, just think about their footprint from an energy perspective, from a supply chain perspective, recycling perspective. It just touches so many different elements uh, around a sustainable future. So I would want to be a head of sustainability uh, to achieve net neutrality at one of those organizations, I think would be super exciting job to do. Thanks, you are that's great. Charles, what, uh, what would be your, your choice? I, I don't know. I, I might not mind being a founder at CFTE. <laughs> so that might not be a bad place to start. Um, but I think I'd go Yuval's path. I, I don't know if I would say private or public sector, but I would want to be doing something global. Uh, I think, you know, when we talk about ecosystem finance and these sort of things, I mean, these are cross-border plays. These are plays where everybody has to work together. I mean, it just it doesn't do a whole lot of good if, if only one country is doing it and everybody around them isn't. It, it just doesn't solve the problem or, or any of the meaningful problems that are out there. So I would want to be on some kind of a global platform um, and, and able to uh, impact global ecosystems. That might, be, that might be through global supply chains. It might be through geopolitics. But, but I think having a, um, you know, a commitment to cooperation um, and thinking about things from a very macro level and from, a very, again, a very long term view. And, and again, when we look at a lot of financial policies and, and I'm not talking about any particular country, but, you know, it can be very myopic. You know, some of the politics insisted. Right. You know, every three or four years, we, you know, you need to focus on on, you know, maintaining your position as a politician rather than thinking about maybe solving some of the problems that hit the border. So, you know, I think anything, you know, position that might behoove itself to having a, a more of a long-term view, uh, more of a global view, um, and, and somewhere where, you know, we can, you know, focus upon be, being a compass for others. You know, um, I'd love to be in a position to do it myself, but I would also think it's important to be a compass and be able to sort of point the way and, and have people say, okay, well, yeah, let's do that. You know, let's all get together and let's all do that. Um, you know, and having some kind of a, I don't know, uh, what's the word, the um, invisible hand kind of kind of role, I suppose, <laughs> wouldn't be so bad. Um, but again, as everyone else said, happy to be where I am now um, as well. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Charles. So, Shavon, you had a bit more time to think. You know, what, you know, what would be your choice? Yeah, thank you very much. It's a, it's a really, I really like this uh, creative c question, uh, and I, I would, as a central banker, I would rather not uh, step uh, in the shoes on, uh, on uh, step in the shoes of uh, anybody else, uh, because as a central banker, we like to live uh, our uh, own uh, world. But, uh, but uh, uh, this is not the the way how we we organize ourselves, uh, and. Uh, and I, I just uh, can join to the others that uh, that uh, I am okay with the, the the place where I am uh, right now, due to the reason that I think, uh, which is very important, uh, to to change uh, your mindset, uh, to change your mindset as a person, as an institution, as a country, as a whole. So, uh, if you have a chance uh, to to do something personally in your private life to to create to 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 facilitate the 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 green ideas uh, you have to do it and uh, and i'm very very uh, honored and and i'm very very delighted that uh, i'm as a deputy governor i have a chance to influence uh, uh, to the to a whole institution and and uh, a, a very very uh, important institution as a central bank and and I would like to catalyze uh, the whole central banks and through the whole central bank whole Hungary uh, to to move towards this uh, direction because somebody told before uh, the outbreak of one of the the, the possible uh, chance to outbreak uh, uh, from this present situation is is to define new uh, new economical uh, 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 approaches and, and, and I think green uh, uh, sustainable finance is, is, is a perfect, perfect way uh, where uh, we can go and, and I hope that uh, whole Hungary can, uh, can follow this path. Thanks a lot, Shabazz. And I think that's a great message to end uh, this panel. 
which is that each of us you know, can have a role and each of us you know, can move our organization to have a role. And at the end, we discuss about a lot of the tools which are available. There's a lot of innovation to be done in, a, in that space. But it seems like we don't have to choose between you know, economy and green. We don't have to choose between health and green. Now, at the end of the day, it can be good you know, for the planet, but it can be good for society and companies also. So thank you very much, you know, of course, you know, to our speakers. Uh, thank you very much to MNB. And thank you very much to all of you, audience. And uh, have a very, very good end of the Singapore FinTech Festival. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Craig. <laughs> You and all the members of the panel, I'd uh, like to thank you all for your truly informative and forward-seeing thoughts on these issues. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now approaching the end of our Budapest event. I do believe that today's keynote addresses and lively discussions brought us closer to understanding and internalizing those crucial issues where wider perspectives and innovative approaches are elemental for long-term success in the fields of financial inclusion and sustainable finance. We've heard about innovative public and private projects, as well as the uh, promotion of mindful digital finances in different continents along the same objectives. We must be aware that our future starts now, and we must therefore consider all possible ways in which market participants and regulators alike can initiate or even speed up activity in green finance. Every virtual or actual step we make needs to serve sustainability so as to save our planet for future generations. Today, we have heard about so many promising initiatives that I trust we can remain optimistic, although these and many more initiatives first have to become reality. I thank you for your kind attention, and I wish that the rest of your day be just as informative and entertaining as it's been so far. From the entire team here in Budapest, we hope and trust that next year we will be able to meet with you in person. Say stay, stay safe and enjoy the rest of the festival.
Azt gondolom, hogy ez az épület mondjuk az ország egyik legjelentősebb műemléke. A régészeti ásatásnak az eredményei adtak arra reményt, hogy esetleg el lehet dönteni, hogy tényleg itt volt a középkor óta a városháza. Úgyhogy a kihívás az abszolút megvolt. Az épület megújításával kapcsolatosan alapvetően három feladatunk volt. Az egyik feladat az egy műemléki rekonstrukció, a másik nagy feladat csoport az az volt, hogy a XXI. századtól elvárható technikai berendezések, gépészet, hogy kerüljön úgy be ebbe a házba, hogy a lehető legkevesebbet lásson ebből után egy látogató. És a harmadik feladat az, az pedig mondjuk az épület bővítése volt. Az ország egyik legemblematikusabb területének legemblematikusabb épülete újjá születik. Ez, ez valóban egy nagyon fontos szimbólummal és jelentőséggel bír. A földszint és a pince szint az mindenki számára megnyitott, turisták, városlakok számára megnyitott gyakorlatilag közönségforgalmi terekből fog állni, és az emelet, illetve a tetőtér, az pedig olyan részben oktatási részben reprezentatív előadó tereket fogad be, amelyek mondjuk a nagy közönség elől zártak, vagy ellenőrzött terek. A XXI. században rendkívül fontos szerepe és jelentősége van a tudásnak, a kreativitásnak és az innovációnak. Az egyik legfontosabb cél, hogy egy olyan oktatási tudásközpont jöjjön létre a Szent Háromság téren, amely valóban az értékekről, az érték teremtésről, az érték őrzésről és a tudás megosztásról szól. Geopolitics, History, Economics The book titled American Empire vs. European Dream by Gyurgy Matolcsi, the governor of the Central Bank of Hungary, has been released. Providing a broad perspective, it analyzes the process of how the American Empire became the world's number one superpower, what motivations other major players in geopolitics had, how the European Union attempted to compensate the hegemon status of the American Empire and how the European dream shattered at the dawn of a new world order. You can find the answers to these questions, as well as many important and topical issues, in Gyurgy Matolcsi's new book, which has already achieved international success. The book is available in bookstores or online, in the web shop of Paulos Atene Publishing House, or on Amazon.com. Is it a dream or reality that captivates me with its beauty? Since we arrived, I feel closer to life. The whole world is open here. And we look for the same things over and over again. Stop!
mondjuk az ország egy legjelentősebb műemléke. A régészeti ástásnak az eredményei adtak arra reményt, hogy esetleg el lehet dönteni, hogy tényleg itt volt a középkor óta a városháza, úgyhogy a kihívás az abszolút megvolt. Az épület megújításával kapcsolatosan alapvetően három feladatunk volt. Az egyik feladat az egy műemléki rekonstrukció, a másik nagy feladat csoport az az volt, hogy a 21. századtól elvárható technikai berendezések, gépészet, hogy kerüljön úgy be ebbe a házba, hogy a lehető legkevesebbet lásson ebből után egy látogató. És a harmadik feladat az, az pedig mindig az épület bővítése volt. Az ország egyik legemblematikusabb területének legemblematikusabb épülete újjá születik. Ez, ez valóban egy nagyon fontos szimbólummal és jelentőséggel bír. A földszint és a pince szint az mindenki számára megnyitott, turisták, városlakok számára megnyitott, gyakorlatilag közönségforgalmi terekből fog állni, és az emelet, illetve a tetőtér, az pedig olyan részben oktatási, részben reprezentatív előadó tereket fogad be, amelyek mondjuk a nagy közönség elől zártak, vagy ellenőrzött terek. A XXI. században rendkívül fontos szerepe és jelentősége van a tudásnak, a kreativitásnak és az innovációnak. Az egyik legfontosabb cél, hogy egy olyan oktatási tudásközpont jöjjön létre a Szent Háromság téren, amely valóban az értékekről, az érték teremtésről, az érték őrzésről és a tudás megosztásról szól. Geopolitics, History, Economics The book titled American Empire vs. European Dream by Gyurgy Matolcsi, the governor of the Central Bank of Hungary, has been released. Providing a broad perspective, it analyzes the process of how the American Empire became the world's number one superpower, what motivations other major players in geopolitics had, how the European Union attempted to compensate the hegemon status of the American Empire and how the European dream shattered at the dawn of a new world order. You can find the answers to these questions, as well as many important and topical issues, in Gyurgy Matolcsi's new book, which has already achieved international success. The book is available in bookstores or online, in the web shop of Paulos Atene Publishing House, or on Amazon.com. And I love you like no one ever loved anyone before Love you like no one ever loved any.
Recognizing the importance of technological innovation and digital transformation, as well as the magnitude of their impact on the economy, the Central Bank of Hungary and its subsidiaries, the Gyro ZRT and the Budapest Institute of Banking and the Budapest Stock Exchange, decided to increase their presence in the international fintech ecosystem and accelerate economic thinking on a digital and sustainable future. Our first speaker today is Mr. Lajos Barta, Executive Director for Financial Infrastructures and Banking Operations at the Central Bank of Hungary. He was one of the speakers of yesterday's panel discussion on payment infrastructures. Please welcome Mr. Barta and his insights on the instant payment system as a new form in Hungary. Thank you, Peter. Giving me 10 minutes for a presentation about the essence of the Hungarian instant payment scheme is a challenge like we have given to the Hungarian banking sector a few years ago to make payments in maximum five seconds. So, but I tried, since the Hungarian banking sector was successful, I do hope I will be successful as well. So let's uh, look at the first uh, picture. What are the basic operational rules of the Hungarian model? You see here, uh, blocks in blue and red. What are in blue? These are quite common uh, parameters for instant payments around the world, like uh, main rules in rule books, uh, or instant clearing and settlement on individual transaction basis, or message standards are based on, in Europe at least, on the SEPA instant credit uh, scheme. But we have some specialties in Hungary, like uh, for the time being, I haven't heard yet that in any other countries it is mandatory. Mandatory means that all Hungarian payment service providers, which were at the time of the project 35 uh, different market players, had to be ready by the same time with the project, and they had to go live on the same day. And all kind of uh, individual credit transfers uh, below one, uh, 10 million foreign must go to the instant payment scheme. So this is the rule which we have included in a central bank decree and which we have just given to the banking sector. The other Hungarian unique idea is in the liquidity management of the system. In the liquidity management, normally the instant schemes are based on the pre-funding, so participants have to pre-fund their liquidity needs. And if they miscalculate the liquidity for a weekend or for a longer period, then they can run out of the liquidity and then they can stop. In Hungary, uh, based on the request of the Hungarian banking sector, we have created a credit line, which is an automated credit line, and which works during the outside of the normal operating hours. So at the weekends and during the night. So if a Hungarian participant in the instant payment scheme miscalculates the liquidity need, then automatically it can be granted a credit line by the Hungarian Central Bank, and then the normal smooth operation is granted. The third uh, parameter, which is specially uh, characteristics for the Hungarian system, is the maximum five seconds of the execution time. In other countries, we have we seen 10 seconds, 15 seconds, or even there is no limitation in the time. In Hungary, we have decided at the very beginning that the instant payment should be used also in the physical payment area. So therefore, we have given the sector that the maximum execution time might be not more than five seconds. And the fourth uh, interesting Hungarian uh, idea in the parameters is 
that in Hungary the standards are open and interoperability must be ensured by the participants. So if somebody, a market player, would like to introduce a QR code in the Hungarian ecosystem, then this QR code must be open for any other players. So we will not see any fragmentation in the service of the payment service providers. I wouldn't say that we haven't faced a lot of challenges during the project. We have seen that in 35 different players, there are different infrastructures in the background. And to make them able to execute transactions in five seconds or to operate 724, this was not uh, the same work for a small bank or for a large bank. The other issue which we have experienced that uh, the major challenge was basically not the 724, uh, but the no plan downtime. So we have written in the, uh, in the rules that the banks cannot stop the instant payment uh, service. They have to receive always the instant payment transactions. And this was a big challenge for the banking sector. And uh, we have experienced also a very interesting uh, story on the vendor side. It turned out that the vendor side is very concentrated, so therefore we have seen a lack of capacities on the vendor side, so the, sometimes the banks could not go with the project according to the timeline because uh, the vendors could not make the homework. And uh, at the beginning, we also planned that from the first day, we will let uh, the bulk corporate payments also into the system. But during the preparation, we had to make a change in our mind, and we had to change the rule, and we didn't allow to come the bulk corporate payments from the first day to the system, which was the 2nd of March 2020, but after six months. Today it's already uh, possible, but it's not mandatory, it's optional. If you look at the milestones and uh, if you look at the uh, major steps in the project, in spite of the complexity uh, of the of the task that all Hungarian players had to be ready by the same date, uh, we gave quite an ambitious timeline for the banking sector. The central bank decree with the execution times and with the deadline was publicated on, in December 2017. The project, the nationwide project, which coordinated the, the banking sector, was uh, introduced in July 2017. And the uh, go-live date which we have defined was July, 1st of July 2019. So it was basically two, two and a half years preparation time, which was for, uh, for creating the system, for testing, and uh, for having coordinated tests with the participation of the central infrastructure as well. Just a few months before the uh, plan go live date, uh, it turned out that not everybody can finish the project in time. Therefore, the central bank decided to postpone the go live date with eight months. And in the end, on the 2nd of March 2020, on the same day, all the Hungarian payment service providers could go live and without any significant uh, disturbance in the in the uh, system. And from this date, we don't see any uh, significant uh, downtime, we don't see any problem, any incident, neither in the central part of the infrastructure nor in the banking end. If we see a few achievements of the instant payment uh, project in Hungary, I can say that in seven months, uh, 77 million transactions were executed uh, altogether with the ONAS uh, transactions in Hungary. This means that more than 10 million instant payment transactions per month. And we see that more than 40% of the interbank transactions are already in the instant payment scheme. The rest is mainly those type of uh, payment instructions which are not mandatory, like the corporate bulk payments and the value-dated payments. But we see that the banks started to develop for this, and uh, some of them already started to bring the bulk corporate payments also to the system. Which is very interesting and which was very surprising for us a bit, 
that nearly 30% of the transactions are initiated by the participants, by the end users, outside of the previous normal operating hours. So these are uh, instructed either in the night or at the weekend. So this is very interesting. And I can say very proudly that uh, although we just said that five seconds is the maximum uh, time limit for the transactions, but 95% of the transactions are executed in less than two seconds. And uh, of course, we have some plans for the future as well. The Hungarian Central Bank and the Gyro provides the central infrastructure, a database for secondary IDs, the processing of the request to pay messages, operational guidelines, and we also created the domestic QR code standard. And uh, in the result of this, the market players can develop different uh, new payment solutions on the basic infrastructure, and we have a request or we have a, a prediction for the next 10 years, we expect that uh, the electronic payments in Hungary will grow dramatically in the next uh, few years. One side of this uh, increase will come from the bank card transaction and the other side will come from the instant payment scheme. And we think that from the current 20% uh, share of the electronic payments in the Hungarian payment ecosystem, by 2030, and the share will reach around 45-50%, which is an average, uh, average of the European countries. And I think that with this uh, new development, which we have just finished uh, this year, we can reach this ambitious goal as well. Thank you for your attention. As our next speaker, I'm pleased to introduce Mr. Gabor Donoki, Head of Service Management at Gyro ZRT, which is the automated clearinghouse operator in Hungary that played a significant role in launching the instant payment system on the 2nd of March this year. Please welcome Mr. Donoki, who will tell us how to jumpstart instant payment. Hi, uh, Mr. Borta was uh, giving some insights on uh, the characteristics of the system. Now, I would like to also give some information uh, how is to uh, how it's possible to go successfully uh, live with such a system, with such a high uh, participation that each and every uh, member of the Hungarian com banking community must be there at the same time. And I will also uh, give you some information on the next, next steps, uh, what we plan uh, to develop on this system in the future. Uh, if you look at this uh, slide, uh, this map, it is to see that in all continents, uh, all over the world, whether it's developed or undeveloped area, there are some uh, implementation of uh, some kind of uh, real-time payment solutions. But what is not to see, how ubiquitous is this? So how many people are using this? And uh, as it was mentioned by uh, Mr. Barta, <coughs> here in Hungary, it was uh, an obligatory to participate in this uh, project. Therefore, from the day one, we have 100% reach. And also, uh, we have a 40% mar market share from the uh, day one. So it is meaning that everyone has access uh, to this system. And uh, each and every person or corporate is having the possibility to use the IP system. Uh, if you look at uh, this chart, you can see that uh, at day zero, day one, <coughs> we started to uh, use it on a very high level. And uh, through the uh, period of the pandemics, there was a moderate growth. But after six months, when the batch transactions were allowed to send in, and another growth has been started, and uh, it is also uh, to know that other banks have started to, to work on that, that the uh, development of the best transactions uh, will be there. So it, uh, we expect some more uh, growth. And uh, it is a critical infrastructure because it is not only uh, the peer-to-peer -to -peer transactions, what we see on that, but also the corporates that are sending uh, into the system. 
So in these six months, the IP system has proven that it can cope with big, uh, big volumes and it is also resilient. And uh, it's not easy to guarantee this reliability and resiliency from day one. And uh, here are what we think the biggest challenges were uh, through the project. So let's start with the 33 banks. 33 banks have to be there and, uh, and uh, reach the line of the goal at the same time. And those are differing, differing in size, differing in technological backgrounds, and differing in, uh, in customer base as well. But despite of that, we had to make sure that uh, we are going together. And the system must be quick. One of the, the use cases is the retail payment. And in the retail, you have to be able to handle parallel, parallel transactions. Therefore, we have tested the system for 500 transactions per second. We have already experienced 155 second, uh, transactions in a second one time. And also, as it was mentioned uh, by Mr. Barta, we uh, have focused uh, through the development for uh, the one-minute transaction uh, time in end-to-end uh, -end processing, uh, but uh, obligatory was the five seconds. So, high volumes, high market share. We had to make sure that low error rates and low R, tra uh, R transactions will be there by the handling of these nine to ten million transactions in a month. And uh, this is how we did it. These are what we think the key factors. We have partnered, partnered with Nets, who is the, uh, who is the Danish uh, accounting house. <clears throat> they have uh, already proven their technology there. And, uh, and also we have uh, partnered with, uh, with the stakeholders of the project, not only with the banking sector, of course, with them, but also uh, with other organizations and companies that had worked together, also with uh, the National Bank, who has dreamed this whole project, uh, IP system in Hungary, and also, for example, with, uh, with the vendors in the bank. So if they had problems, we were there to discuss and try to find out what is the best solution to go forward. At some times, we had cut back also the ambitions. For example, in, in uh, batch handling. At the first time, we were only focusing on the individual transactions, and only after this September, we have allowed to send in batch transactions. We have had a very long and extensive testing period. Uh, it was, as it was mentioned, the central infrastructure had went live first, and uh, after this period, we have uh, more than six months of testing with 80 million transactions in weekly cycles. And those tests were uh, live transactions in a limited uh, uh, environment, limited and controlled environment, which has made possible that uh, we have tested the whole end-to-end -end procedure with the banks. It has helped us to make a resilient system, and it has helped also the banks to, to get the whole procedure finalized. And uh, this first uh, so selected go live of the, of the systems helped us uh, that there was no IT replacement needed in the, in the center. If I want to use the, uh, a military expression, then uh, we have left no one uh, behind. Despite of the different backgrounds of the banks, we have gone with them in the same speed of the testing, and we have done it all together. So if any of you is engaged in a similar, uh, similar project, I would suggest to focus on these areas. Now I would like to talk a little about the future. Uh, this system is designed to grow. Designed to grow uh, regarding the transactions, as I mentioned you, the metrics. So the number of the transactions, what we can handle, there is a big room. And uh, it is also designed to grow regarding the number of the participants. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, only six months after the launch, the public launch of the system, already TransferWise has joined uh, it. So there, uh, there, uh, in the system, we have already a FinTech participant. And uh, the pricing favors the participants uh, uh, to increase their activity. And I can tell that is uh, easy and commercially attractive to join to the system. 
If we are talking about the future and the development of the system, of course, we have to talk about the, the overlaying solutions what we are having in the system. Uh, we are already having secondary identifiers. There is addressable telephone number, addressable email addresses and text uh, uh, identifiers. Also, we have from uh, day one a request to pay solution in the system. Not all the banks has yet joined, but uh, some of them are already uh, able to grant this service and uh, we are uh, hoping to get all of them on board soon. Uh, as already mentioned, the batch handling has been introduced in September. And uh, just lately, we have introduced a new service, which is allowing debulking and bulking of the request to pay transactions, which is meaning that participants and also non-participants of organizations are able to send in request to pays uh, in, in batches. And uh, if we are focusing to the future, we started to develop a mobile payment app. Uh, internationally, it is to see that uh, such solutions are really fostering the usage of the uh, instant payment systems. And uh, we would like to help the community uh, also with such solution. And uh, also, we have, uh, we have started a bank ID project, uh, which is uh, helping customer uh, authentication, uh, authentication and identification in a much smoother way to the uh, financial sector and maybe later also to the non-financial organizations. And uh, since that we are in the middle of the Europe and our system is supporting the uh, SCT INS scheme, now we are just uh, evaluating the possibilities, what, uh, how we can help the Hungarian banking community to join uh, the European instant payment services. And uh, if I would like to uh, summarize, then I can tell that we have a big market share right now. We are already handling big volumes and it is easy to join. So I can tell that Hungary is very committed to the instant payment and uh, in the middle, in the central infrastructure, we are helping to develop, uh, to, to develop the banks to work on it. Thank you very much. Please welcome now Mr. Tomáš Tort, Senior Economist at the Central Bank of Hungary. Mr. Tort will tell us about the New Payments in Digital Finance online course launched by the Budapest Institute of Banking and the Centre for Finance, Technology and Entrepreneurship. Thank you, Peter, dear colleagues, dear attendees. Let me introduce myself, myself just in a couple of sentences. Uh, I'm Tomasz Todt, and I work for the Magyar Nemzeti Bank, the Central Bank uh, of Hungary, and uh, for uh, BIB, the Budapest Institute of Banking, as a project manager. I was responsible for this huge project to improve in this uh, online uh, course called Payments in Digital Finance. Let me have some fun fact in terms of the course. Uh, we started this work uh, this year in January. And actually this work uh, lasted almost for one year. It's very, very, a very, very huge period in my mind. Uh, it took uh, more than three months to control, to monitor the mar market, this financial payment market, and uh, find the right persons who can help us uh, to cover this huge area. And uh, as you see uh, on the board, we are very proud that we can announce that we uh, could do it. Uh, yesterday we had the lunch event, and uh, today uh, I had uh, the text to repeat myself on to repeat ourselves that we could do it. And uh, please uh, let me have some sentences to introduce uh, this course. As you see, the lineup is excellent. Uh, we have uh, five senior lecturers. 
uh, who are worldwide known and this uh, topic worldwide known in digital payments and digital payments area and they were responsible for the for bringing the content and moreover we have uh, 33 experts from all over the world uh, who have fleshed their own perspective uh, in terms of a smaller uh, topic. Actually, we are very proud that we had uh, two uh, program directors, and one of the program directors uh, is from Hungary, his Gabor. And, uh, I would like to say a very special thank to Gabor and uh, Fabian because who had an excellent work and this way we could stay in the background and uh, we could have uh, this uh, excellent program now. And uh, another fun fact that uh, one year before when we started to thinking about launching uh, this uh, online course, we saw that the payment market is changing very, very fast. And the main driver is the digitalization. Digitalization changes uh, the core systems, and we realize that uh, the staff hasn't prepared for this changing, hasn't prepared for it. And that's why we decided to improve this course, uh, this uh, education program. And uh, now we want to spread it uh, all over the world, on the market, and the future. And if you want to go into the details, I will suggest you uh, the landing page. You can find the detailed agenda and the list of the experts, and uh, any more fun facts uh, in terms of the education program. And if you have any more questions, just please let me know. Thank you for your attention. That is indeed a unique course with experts from esteemed institutions. Our next speaker, Ms. Kotopal, is Head of International Business Development and Innovation at the Budapest Institute of Banking. There is no competitive financial system without competitive knowledge. Their mission is to offer edutainment, that is, education and entertainment simultaneously for future experts in finance. Ms. Pal, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and welcome all of the participants of the Singapore Fintech Festival. The foundation of the Budapest Institute of Banking is rooted in the matching of market needs with the social responsibility objectives of the Central Bank of Hungary and the Budapest Stock Exchange. Our mission and motto is edutainment for future experts in finance. I'm the head of international business development and innovation at BIB almost two years by now. My name is Katapal. So what is BIB? BIB's vision is to become an internationally recognized financial education institution by providing a state-of-the-art learning platform for banking professionals in Hungary, in the CEE region and worldwide. We place special emphasis on fast-moving and disruptive industry trends, such as e-learnings, new regulatory issues or digitalization of payments. Our institute aims to train financial experts who live in this very moment, but being able to tackle the challenges of the future. Covering the entire operation range of the financial sector, as you can see on my PowerPoint, the course grant the opportunities to participants from experts to top managers. Our excellent instructors come from Hungary and from major financial institutions and hubs and from the UK, Spain and the USA. We provide high-quality study materials, tutorials and e-learnings. As well, as we all know by now, COVID-19 hit hard on professional education. As lockdowns made impossible to have classroom trainings and workshops, while the demand significantly dropped and, the se and several major players 
of the financial sector cut their training budget. What did we do? In this situation, we changed our strategy within 24 hours. Our first survival move was rapid shift towards online streaming. The second was to focus on corporate responsibility with some free courses. And we have also made significant business development activity based on our core financial trainings. We have concluded almost 70 courses with around 1,300 participants in 2020 up until now. We are also very proud of our fruitful cooperation with the London Stock Exchange Group Academy since 2018 and just launched our very first joint course on ESG matters, focusing on sustainability and green finance. So this is how our international online trainings actually look like with excellent trainers, for example, from Harvard University, such as Mark Esposito. In addition to all these amazing partners, you can see here, in June 2020, BIB gained full membership at EBTN, which is the European Banking and Financial Service Training Association. And we already started working together. Last but not least, the summer our summer school on real estate and finance was the very first joint course with ESTP, which is one of the oldest business schools in Europe. We held this course in 2019, 2020, and coming up in the summer of 2021. So this is the key here, ladies and gentlemen. This is what really needed nowadays. Besides all important strategic steps, corporate values, cash flow optimizations. What do we need now? We also need to focus on people, on talent and education. This is what BIB can offer now and in the future. So be your future with us. Stay safe. Thank you very much. As our next speaker, it is my pleasure to welcome Mr. Daniel Kurdmerti, advisor to the CEO at the Budapest Stock Exchange. A key player in Hungarian money and capital markets, Budapest Stock Exchange provides market players with access to financial resources and offers investors a broad range of investment instruments. Please welcome Mr. Kurdmerti, who will share some interesting facts and figures on Hungary and its markets. Well, first of all, welcome to everyone, and I would like to already thank you for the few minutes and time you will spend with me next when I will introduce you the Budapest Stock Exchange. To start with, I would like to tell you a few words about our economy and to introduce you to the main economic figures of uh, Hungary, uh, because our economy did perform quite well in the past uh, years as a result uh, of uh, the economic growth, uh, our market uh, outperformed the European e Union average because uh, the GDP grew with about 46% uh, in the past 10 years. Can I ask the previous slide, please, to show? Thank you very much. This is on me. So, and, and we did exceed the European Union's average with uh, outperforming the uh, uh, economies and our GDP per capita ended up at uh, 17,000 US dollars by uh, the end of the last year. We are a nation with a population of about 10 million people and about 30% of our uh, uh, population have a university degree. On the bottom of the slide you can see uh, the main economic indicators uh, uh, of our country, which they were appreciated by the investors in the past years. But of course, COVID-19 did uh, leave a mark uh, on our economic figures as well. Our country has solid ratings uh, by the main rating agencies, Moody's at BA3, and by both Fitch and S&P Global, it's triple B. 
On the bottom, you can see the base rate of uh, the National Bank of Hungary, which stands at 0.6%, the lowest in the Central European region. And you can also see the exchange rate evolving during the past years, which did depreciate in the, uh, the past years, especially this year. Hungary's capital market in the region is the second largest. We are following Poland, which is the largest economy in the region and uh, also uh, the largest capital market they have. And our country is followed by the Czech Republic, the third largest capital market, and also the former Yugoslavian countries, Bulgaria, Romania, they do have their own separate capital markets as well. The daily average turnover of the Hungarian stock exchange today is uh, 40 million euro per day. Jumping on the main uh, economic or main market indicators of uh, Budapest Stock Exchange, you can see that the price per earnings, the PE ratio of uh, the companies listed on Budapest Stock Exchange have been between 10 and 15, which is uh, significantly lower than the ones in the Western European markets, you can see. And at the same time, these companies did pay a dividend rate between uh, 2 and 2.5% 2 and uh, to uh, the investors. Our trading system runs on the Xetra platform, which is a, a German-owned uh, uh, trading platform, and it is widely used in Western Europe and also Eastern Europe by several other countries, such as Austria, Germany, Czech Republic, Bulgaria, and this is appreciated by the investors who wish to access our market. We run on a continuous trading model, which means that uh, during the day uh, the trading uh, is... Uh, going on uh, all the time, and there is an auction at the beginning, at the end of the uh, ses trading session. Altogether, we have about 85 listed companies, equities and bonds. There are 25 brokerage houses who are members on our market, and our stock exchange is 81% owned by MNB, the Central Bank of Hungary. It is also worth noting that our market is fairly concentrated, which means that uh, most uh, of the trading takes place in four, uh, the main, uh, four main names uh, for companies. We can see that our market is dominated by foreign investors, both in terms of the turnover and in terms of ownership structure of uh, the, the Hungarian shares. And it is also worth noting that uh, about 70% of the trading does take place on Budapest Stock Exchange of all the Hungarian shares. We have several types of uh, products available for investing, equities, bonds, commodities, and also investors can access MTFs and a derivative section. And finally, it is also Im important to mention that we do have a focus on SME companies uh, in the past years, we offer a whole ecosystem to list and access capital for SME companies. Thank you very much. The Central Bank of Hungary has been actively involved in developing a competitive financial sector, a vibrant fintech ecosystem, a supportive environment and a modern regulatory background. Please welcome Mr. Peter Feikisch, Director at the Digitalization Directorate, who will share the Central Bank's approach to fostering innovation and financial awareness in the digital space. Thank you, Peter. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, in this short session, I would like to highlight actually two digital initiatives of the Central Bank of Hungary, the MMB Innovation Hub and the Digital Student Safe. Uh, in the case of the MMB Innovation Hub, the main goal of the MMBs and actually our goal is that how can we support the digital transformation of the financial institutions, the traditional players, the so-called incumbents, and how can we also support the innovation in the fintech ecosystem. The real challenge here is that how can we ride, find the right balance between supporting innovation and also keeping the trust in the financial system and also uh, mitigating the potential risks. Uh, 
Uh, the MNB, uh, the Central Bank of Hungary, has launched its innovation hub in 2018, in the beginning of 2018, and we also launched the regulatory sandbox in Hungary at the end of 2018. The MNB Innovation Hub has actually four plus one main functions. The first very important function is the information repository, where the, the, the different innovators can get actually an overview about the legal requirements in Hungary, especially focusing on financial services. The second important uh, function of the MNB Innovation Hub is the regulatory support platform, where the innovators are able to ask direct questions to the to the to the regulator, where they can uh, receive actually tailor-made answers for their innovation if there are any questions on a legal perspective. The third very important function of the MMB Innovation Hub is, of course, the communication hub. The communication is essential in the case of innovation. It's not only very important between the regulators and the innovators, but also very essential among innovators. The fourth important function of the MMB Innovation Hub uh, in the case of, uh, of, 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 uh, of the international cooperation. Of course, during the FinTech Festival, it's very straightforward that why this issue is very, very important. A very good example is the cooperation agreement between the MES and the MMB, which was just announced today. And of course, the fifth very important function of the MMB Innovation Hub is the regulatory sandbox, where innovators are able to test their innovat innovations or innovative services for a limited time period, for a limited number of customers, but on real customers. Uh, in a nutshell, actually, uh, you can see on this chart that this initiative the MMB Innovation Hub was quite popular. We have a very, very nice traction. And since its launch, we received more than 90 requests from different innovators. So it seems that it was a very, very effective and quite popular initiative. And finally, let me just say a few words, actually, about the other initiative of the Central Bank of Hungary, the Digital Student Safe. The Digital Student Safe is actually a pilot project of the, of the MMB. Uh, it was launched in the mid of September 2020, uh, and it's quite popular among the students. Although it's a pilot project, it has more than 1,500 students already in the system. It's actually a mini mobile bank for students. However, it has a different user interface for students and for parents, and it has a lot of function, among others, they are able to receive quizzes, they can solve these quizzes, they are able to transfer different medals with each other, and, and a lot more. If you are interested either on the MMB Innovation Hub or on the Digital Student Safe, please visit either the dedicated website of the MMB on Innovation Hub or please visit our international pavilion on the Singapore FinTech Festival. Thank you very much for your attention. So now, ladies and gentlemen, in closing, I'd just like to thank all our presenters for informing us of these truly interesting approaches and projects. And I'd also like to thank you for your kind attention and wish that the rest of your day be just as informative and entertaining. <laughs>